the thing that gives me the most anxiety is perhaps a, a cut that comes too soon from central banks. Markets are expecting that they could move as soon as the next couple of months. We think that that will be too soon. We should be thinking about whether or not they'll have to restart the rate hike cycle. I don't think we're at an inflection point at the moment. Trend signals have finally turned long. It signals the end of the tightening cycle, and it suggests that we're going through a regime change. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is Payrolls Friday, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market this morning negative again by 0.2%, with the S&P on a four-day losing streak. The Nasdaq 100 making it day five in yesterday's session. TK, payroll's just around the corner. Payroll's around the corner. I'm going to go right to the 20 lines of statistics and say average hourly earnings year over year, 3.9%. I don't know how that moves, but if it moves a certain way enough, maybe it affects the stock market, which is open grim for 2024. It's been a struggle coming out of the gate for 2024, hasn't it? The longest daily losing streak on the Nasdaq now going back to late 2022. The numbers today, at least 175, the median estimate in our survey, the big banks on Wall Street grouped somewhere between 170 to 190. With the whisper figure being 188,000 on the Bloomberg terminal, is bad news, good news, and good news, bad news? Is that essentially the paradigm that we're in? We should have uh, some discussions around that because ultimately that's what we keep seeing. The better the data, the worse the reaction in markets. It's been a drip feed of decent data in the last 24 hours. The ADP report better than expected. The jobless claims number, Tom, the right kind of downside surprise. Will payrolls follow that up to make it three out of three? We're desperate for information. I mean, we had this very strange fourth quarter. We've had the first days of the year, a huge challenge. Some people taking the data back to the 1970s. And then now what? And the what is we're begging for a narrative at 830 like I haven't seen in ages. Some people begging for rate cuts. Bob Michael in the FT, check out this quote. This line I'm jumps out, Bramo. Now that inflation has come down before the next shock materializes, the Fed should start cutting rates. The Fed, Bramo, should start cutting. That's what everybody is hoping. And that's what we can see baked into markets. And the Fed is starting to push back. But even more than the Fed, the data is starting to push back. So at what point do people wake up to the fact that the data is not confirming the idea well, that you have enough to start cutting <clears throat> rates, even surgically, especially if oil prices keep climbing and we do see some of these other kind of strengthening the, the, uh, trends? The great observer of this, Matthew Klein, was out in social, and he agrees with Bob Michael. And he says... It is a restrictive policy now, and they've got to get started. And John, the distinction here into the Fed meeting coverage that we're going to have in January is, do you have a measured approach by the Fed, or do they just at least come out? I don't know why they're waiting to March. Just come out in 10 days and say, OK, here's the first rate cut, and we'll see what the narr how the narrative Based unfolds. on the data we've had so far, so let's think about what's happened in early 24. We've got this gap, TK, between the market and the perceived gap between the market and the Federal Reserve. And it's closing the other way with the market coming towards the Federal Reserve. Just a little bit early days, Tom, but off the back yeah. of decent data, <clears throat> just a drip feed of better than expected data, Lisa, in the last couple of days. Double Lines Jeff Sherman yesterday on Bloomberg Television came out and said, it just seems it's a little optimistic today to think that it's going to happen so soon, talking about rate cuts, as early as March. This is the issue. People have been able to bully the Fed into doing their bidding. They haven't been able to this time around and in this cycle. And this really is the key question. When do people start to realize their hopes don't necessarily create reality? Jobless claims at 202 yesterday, 202. <laughs> Thousand. Let's turn to the price action. The score's going into payrolls. Payrolls about two hours and 27 minutes away. Equity futures coming down again by 0.2%. The dollar stronger. The euro just about holding on to 109, 109.13 on that currency pair. And yields on a 10 year through 4%, up by four basis points, Lisa. So the 10 year 4.04% this morning. The last time they closed above 4% was December 13th on the Fed meeting day. I am watching 8.30 a.m. A non farm payrolls report. John went over the headline numbers, the fact that the expectation is 175,000. I'm watching average hourly earnings. The year over year expectation is for it to come in at 3.9%, which is down from 4%, but still way too high for this Federal Reserve. That to me might indicate some sort of stickiness that the market will wake up. 
up to at 10 a.m. ISM services data comes out. I just want to note, it has been an expansionary territory for every month except for one going back to the, uh, the emergence from the pandemic in May of 2020. Can we continue this expansion at 1.30 p.m.? Richmond Fed's president, uh, Tom Barkin, is planning to speak. We also are going to be hearing throughout the show, we're very lucky to have uh, former Fed officials Randy Krosner and Bill Dudley joining. To me, I'm actually more curious about the former Fed officials. What do you do with a really unclear moment that harkens maybe better back to the 1948 period rather than the 1970s? Elisa, thanks for that. Looking forward to all of that still to come through this morning. With us around the table, Steve Whiting, Chief Investment Strategist and Chief Economist at City Global Wealth. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Great to catch up with you, sir. Always is. I want to bring up that quote from... Bob Michael at JP Morgan in the FT this morning. Just have a read of this. I want your response to it, if we can get it. Now that inflation has come down before the next shock materializes, the Fed should start cutting rates. What do you think about that? Well, again, you know, conceptually, that sounds good. Is that something that the Federal Reserve is in the practice of doing? No. You know, not around this time. You know, you, you've got to give them some time. Monetary policy is restrictive. Let's zoom out for a moment and just say, what we've learned last year is that you don't have to crush the economy. You don't have to have an economic collapse to get the inflation rate lower, right? You know, there were numerous pieces of what happened in the upheaval of the economy in the last few years that made price stability impossible. Um, as we normalized, and including monetary policy, again, inflation's come down, and it will continue to slowly come down. Measured inflation this year, with a lot of confidence, it's going to come down. But... You know, are we in an environment where the Federal Reserve is going to, again, preemptively uh, say, well, let's quickly get back to a neutral position? You know, again, it sounds nice uh, in practice, but again, the committee dynamics, these sorts of things, right. it's not going to happen that quickly. I mean, you mentioned restriction and others out there are talking about a Fed that's behind the curve here when looking at the, the markets. Does the Fed restriction do enough where it slows down the economy and gives us a more diminished corporate earnings outlook than the optimism that's out there right now. You know, look, we, we think that things are a little different this time in one respect. Last year, if we take a look at 493 companies, take out the MAG-7, right, um, which had a really bad 2022. Um, it looks like we had about a 6% EPS drop last year. Um, that's consistent, again, certainly of no collapse in the economy. But a, a lot of things look like we've been in a mild recession. We haven't had a good growth year since 2021. Right. right. Uh, industrial production has been down for a year, especially ar around the world. Global trade was down nearly 10 percent at its low point. Um, lots of things uh, in cyclical industries, um, housing, again, have all been really, really dragging quite weak for a good period of time. Mm -hmm. So I think we're in a position where earnings are recovering more broadly this year. Right. Well, Gina Martin Adams of Bloomberg agrees with you strongly on that. The basic idea to me, though, is if we are restrictive, can you get a growthy year? That, to me, is the heart of the matter. I think it's a, it's a transition, and I think 2025 will be the year where when you look back and say it was a stronger year. Um, we, this fall in inflation is a sign that we can have a healthier economy. Uh, and that's where we're headed. And if we, uh, you know, again, we went from discounting, well, it's going to be doomsday and high inflation forever to perfect Goldilocks very, very quickly. You know, there's going to be some give and take in that. But people get very um, superstitious that this is happening at the beginning of the year. Well, but to Tom's point, right, does it even matter if the Fed cuts in, in March, right, for the earnings recovery that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to make a difference in the earnings environment, may do a little bit of, uh, you know, difference in how the market trades in a, a very short period of time. Okay, so when you start to look at your wager on the stock market, you are bullish on equal weight because it has been underperforming to such right. a degree relative to the other the most going back to 1998. How much is that predicated on anything related to the Fed? How much is good news good news to really uh, lean into the Citigroup view? No, no, you know, look, um, you know, if the economy unfolds as we expect, uh, and again, we're saying ballpark, the Fed doesn't know when it's going to, to ease, right? So everybody's saying, well, it's gonna be March, it's gonna be May. You know, around mid-year, we think again, just turning away from trying to crush the economy, turning away from trying to force down inflation and willing to sacrifice the economy with a recession. You know, that's a big deal in itself. And, you know, that's why we had a big fourth quarter uh, right in the markets. Uh, and I think, again, if we come to grips, if the demand side of the economy is not collapsing and the production side is going to start to catch up with demand, we're going to have rising corporate profits this year. 
uh, and I think it's going to be a better 2025. And so we will see that more companies and more sectors will have a better performance this year, but it's, it's no 26% S&P return year. We said that last year, and then we got one. <laughs> well, you know, and who was saying that last year? I don't know about anybody saying that last year. Well, we year. said no 26% gain, and then we got a 24% gain. Steve, let's talk about the state of the U.S. consumer. What is the state of the U.S. consumer now relative to where it was 12 months ago? Well, uh, look, it's been positives and negatives, and you know, people have to have this balance. I mean, there's, there's several different ingredients in this recipe. Uh, some of them are sweet, and some of them are sour. Okay, so we're seeing slowing employment growth. Let's remember in the employment report that we're about to see, December's mostly seasonal adjustment, especially January, right? So this is a, a, an environment where, again, there's some cyclical industries uh, that are shedding employment at this particular moment in time. We will seasonally adjust that away. But the baseline, what we've been seeing is slower and slower gains for employment, but they are gains, mm -hmm. right? Inflation has come down at a headline level, and that's meant for people who are already employed, right? A massive drag on their income growth is disappearing. Um, I, you see plenty of signs that, uh, again, the aggregate consumer, well, there are plenty of stretched consumers, too. Uh, so I think, again, it's in this middle ground that's very hard for right. people uh, you know, to say that there's very much going on here. But I think it's a mild upturn in a probably a moderating consumer demand environment. I went ballistic earlier this week on underweight, sell, all the other nuances of the securities uh, business. Are you underweight the MAG-7? Are you selling the MAG-7? Are they a buy and hold? You know, um, when they fall, I think they're a buy. When they have, always when they've had corrections, again, whether it's it's FANG or MAG-7, when they've had significant corrections, they have great long-term earnings growth. You know, I think you, should be, you shouldn't be um, staking out a big position in MAG-7. Um, I think they'll be more idiosyncratic. What uh, I love is the fact that mid-cap growth companies are trading at 16 times when their long-term average is 21 times. Right. Final question, job guess in a couple of hours' time. What are you, you know, look, looking for? Um, I, I don't think that there's a problem with the consensus. I think, uh, you know, given the seasonal biases, I would be, um, you know, slightly inclined to expect something slightly softer. The revisions alone, though, could make that almost immaterial. 175, the estimate today. Steve, good to catch up. Good Thank to see you. you. Steve Whiting there of City Global Wealth. Let's go through the numbers together. 175K is the estimate in our survey. TK, the previous number, 199. Unemployment expected to come in at 3.8%. The previous number, 37 Wage growth. Do you want it month over month or year over year, TK? What do you like? McKee would say month over month. I would say year over year just because I don't care about the nuances. I'll give you both. Mr. McKee does. 0.3% for month over month, 0.4% yeah. previously. Right. The estimate for year and over year, 39 versus 4% previously. You bring up a really important point. Jason Furman at Harvard leading on this which is how do you annualize all this mumbo-jumbo we talk about? Do you look at three-month annualize, six-month, 12-month, whatever? I've always sent a tendency to look at 90 days and then take it annual. And Jason's got a big fancy formula that only he can understand that blends all that together. The way to do it is to take the time frame that most justifies your thesis at the time being and then to push I, that I forward. I think you're right. And then to shift yeah. when you start to uh, shift your thesis. That seems to be yeah. sort of uh, the way uh, it's been going. People are talking about six-month annualized inflation going down below the Fed's target and all of a sudden calling victory. So you know, at what point is this the right kind of measure to look at? It's been a tricky one. I don't know, but on wage growth, it's key. And yeah, you know, I, I used to look at duration of unemployment and all these other cultural and social issues of the jobs report. I'm focused on wage, the, the, the wage dynamic today. I think a word that we heard yesterday, diffusion, a TK, a word we might hear a little bit later as well. Just how broad based are some of these gains in the jobs market right now? How yeah. healthy is that 175 if we do indeed get a 175? Kai Rukadonna of being Parabar really pointing out that maybe you're seeing some early weakness, Tom, on yeah, that I, side of things. I, I think within the zeitgeist yesterday, people were noting manufacturing was a little soggy out there. That's not a big part of what Manhattan's looking at, but across the nation. Uh, there's some there's some real pockets of slowdown. We'll catch up with Morgan Stanley about that a little bit later this morning. Coming up on the program in the next hour, Priya Misra of JP Morgan Asset Management on the bond market and what they're looking for in the jobs report a little bit later this morning. The jobs report, two hours and about 20 minutes away. The estimate, 175K. The previous number, 199. A bit of weakness to start the new year. Coming into Friday, we're on a four-day losing streak on the S&P 500. We're negative again this morning. We're down 0.2%. From New York, good morning.
We have seen a, a public credit now that ISIS uh, K has taken for the attack uh, in Iran. We're uh, certainly in no position to to doubt that. Difficult to make a, a quantitative or qualitative assessment of their strength based on this event, this one event. I would just say what we said before, which is ISIS-K does remain uh, a viable terrorist threat. That was U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby speaking yesterday as Secretary of State Antony Blinken heads to the Middle East in an effort to ease rising tensions across the region. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. It is Payrolls Friday and the state of play at the moment, you're familiar with it. A losing streak building on the S&P 500 and on the Nasdaq as well. Four days on the S&P, day five yesterday on the Nasdaq 100. This morning pulling back again going into payrolls. We're negative here by a quarter of 1%. Yields a bit higher by four or five basis points through 4% on a 10-year, 4.0438%. Over the last 24 hours, the data better than expected. An ADP report with an upside surprise, the right kind of downside surprise on jobless claims. TK laying the foundation maybe for more of the same a little bit later. That's what people might be looking out for at 8.30 Eastern time. I don't know, at least I mentioned the whisper number early on there as well, but I, th I just, I never trust this because it's a December report. I'm enough old fogey to go... Did Bloomingdale's hire enough people? What did they do at Macy's? Which I know is completely off the mark, but that's like the collective memory of the 1st of January. No, I think it's report. on the mark. Totally, Tom. I think a lot of people pointed that out yesterday when we got jobless claims. It's that end of December kind of number. How much attention should you pay to it? The problem is, TK, as you know, the boat has become so loaded to the one side looking for rate cuts that you get this drip feed of better economic data just yesterday, do you get it again this morning and you start to push the bets the other way? Well, we're gonna to have to see, and I'm gonna go right to, to January 11th, I believe it is in the inflation report. This is a Fed starving for further information like everybody else is Steve Whiting. I just said we're data dependent. We'll have to see. We'll have that through the morning here as well. Right now, we look at our political economics, our geopolitical realities. No one more qualified to do that than Bobby Ghosh of Bloomberg Opinion with decades of experience in the broader Eastern Mediterranean, including public service tours of duty in Iraq. Bobby, I want to start there. I got three or four, five, six geographies this morning, and I immediately thought of you when I saw Iranian murder, whatever it is, killings in Iraq, where you have such deep experience. Is our eye off the radar? Should we be looking at this relationship between Iraq and Iran? Sunni and Shia is the stereotype. Is that as important as maybe it should be? Well, not so much. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, guys. Uh, not so much Sunni Shia, but certainly the relationship between Iran and a number of bad actors in Iran. These, mili these militias, which happen to be Shia, uh, that are supported and, and financed and armed by <laughs> Iran that have been over several uh, uh, years, but much more recently at a sort of increased pace, taking pot shots, frying missiles and rockets and drones at US positions within, uh, within Iraq and in Syria. Uh, these, are, uh, these are guys who basically do what Iran tells them. They may be Iraqi in nationality, but they serve Iran's purposes. They are similar to Hezbollah, they're similar to Hamas, they're similar to the Houthis. These are all part of this mm -hmm. network of proxies and puppets that Iran uses. And it's not a coincidence that all of them are very active at this moment. Bobby, our collective memory is a technocratic excellence in over the horizon we storm like in Desert Storm some 30 years ago, I, I believe it was. That's not where we are now. It's almost as if it's a diverse and separated out war of religion. Do we know how to fight a religious war in America? Well, what we're facing in the Middle East is a new kind of war. We're not facing a conventional army that will stand up and fight, and then if we defeat them, sign an armistice, sign a, a sue for peace, and then go away. That, that era is now over. What we're facing is a network of uh, actors who are sort of hit and run is their, is their kind of war. They tend to be all Shiite, but... Not, but there are exceptions. Hamas, for instance, is not a Shiite group. That's primarily a Sunni group. 
although they are working with a bunch of other Shiite actors. So yes, they are all individually fired by religion, but they serve the interests of a nation state, and that nation state is Iran. And Iran has shown itself to be quite adept at pulling different kinds of strings. Sometimes, oftentimes it's religion, sometimes it's just money. Sometimes it's just giving a group of people the weapons and the training they need, even if they don't agree with you on religious grounds. That is what makes us all so much more complex. It's very hard to define, okay, if you belong to this group, then you are likely to be, uh, this, is what you're, this is what you believe and therefore, this is how you think about us. It's a much more complex landscape there now than it was during Desert Storm or during the uh, attack on, on Iraq in, after 9-11. This is a much messier, uh, theater of conflict for the United States and for our allies. Tom's asking the right questions uh, because I think that a lot of us, we saw that ISIS claimed the uh, the blame for the attack in Iran. We were all thinking, where did ISIS come from? Wasn't this a proxy war between the West and Iran or Israel and the U.S. and uh, Iran? What else is going on here? What is Tony Blinken going to do with this tinderbox that is incredibly complicated when he goes overseas to the Middle East for his 28th millionth time over the past couple of months? So the ISIS uh, uh, arrival on the scene is completely unexpected, completely out of uh, left field. These terrorist attacks in Iran on uh, people mourning the death of Qasem Soleimani, who was killed by an American drone. Um, ISIS has not mounted an attack of this ambition and this scale within Iran, um, and certainly not out of Afghanistan, which appears to be the case here. This is a rare instance where your enemy's enemy is also your enemy. I mean, Iran and ISIS are enemies. ISIS and, and the West and the United States are enemies. Um, it's and, and Blinken is going into this highly complex situation with a, a very long wish list from the Israelis. He wants what the Biden administration has wanted for several weeks now, which is uh, go easier in, in Gaza. Start thinking about a ceasefire and start thinking about what happens after the ceasefire and, and how Gaza should be administered and, and how the, this enormous damage that is being done needs to be uh, rebuilt. That's also what he's going to be asking of the Gulf Arab states, the oil states which have the resources to help with this. He's also going to Turkey, and and I'm I'm curious. I'd be curious to see what he says there. The last time he went there, he got his ears chewed out by the Turks for not including them in the discussions. He's going to Egypt, uh, which has that border with uh, Gaza in the south. That's where humanitarian aid needs to go in. He needs to get the Israelis to allow that humanitarian aid to go in, and he needs again. Everything begins when the shooting stops. So his number one priority has to be to get the shooting to stop. This would all be very difficult, even if it wasn't for the arrival of ISIS, for the, the increased activities of the Houthis in the Red Sea. We all know that's a vital global trade uh, route. The entire world's 12%, uh, I think is the number, of the whole world's uh, uh, trade passes through that one waterway. So this is no longer just something that only concerns the Middle East. This concerns everybody everywhere. Getting an update on that right now. Bobby, got to go. Bobby Gosh there of Bloomberg Opinion. Here are the headlines. An update from container shipping giant AP Molomask saying it's decided that all vessels due to transit through the Red Sea will be diverted south around the Cape of Good Hope for the foreseeable future. That's a change in language. The foreseeable future. The previous update, the last update we had from Mask, said until further notice they would pause. Tom now deciding to do so for the foreseeable future. Again, I'll just repeat that headline from container shipping giant AP Molomask, saying it's decided that all vessels due to transit through the Red Sea, Tom, will be diverted south around the Cape of Good Hope yeah. for the foreseeable future. It's out of the 19th century, or maybe even the early 20th century, and there's a distinction here. It's a one week longer trip is a basic idea, and you go from 12,000 miles through Suez, this is coming from China to New York, to 14 and a half thousand uh, miles. So you had roughly 2,500 miles uh, to the trip, but it's much more than that. It's just the Suez is so damn easy for everyone involved. Just want to get to the quote from Mess this morning. Here is the direct quote. The situation is constantly evolving and remains highly volatile and all available intelligence at hand confirms that the security risk continues to be at a significantly elevated 
level. Much more on that still to come from New York City on this Payrolls Friday. Good morning. Nine-week winning streak on the S&P 500. We are about to snap that. The S&P on a four-day losing streak. The Nasdaq, day five. Five days of losses in yesterday's session. This morning, we're negative again. We're down 0.4% on the Nasdaq, down 0.3 on the S&P 500. TK, a bit of weakness going into the weekend. It was a little better tape yesterday. And, you know, to be clear, we were back to support or up to resistance, whatever you're looking at. But to be honest, in the last day, John, we started breaking through a lot of support levels. Yesterday is technically a different point than where we were guessing January 2 or January 3. Lisa, you turn to the bond market, breaking some key levels there. A four handle again on a 10 year. Here's the state of play two year, 10 year, 30 year. Yields higher by four or five basis points. The 10 year this morning, Lisa, 4.04%. After the one two punch yesterday of better than expected employment data, one after another. And then, of course, people expecting a pretty robust number today. There is this question of whether people are going to be worried about inflation for two reasons not only a better than expected economy, but also potentially supply shocks. I know we're going to be talking about that coming up. Just 18 percent. I always go back to this in the fund manager survey from Bank of America. 18 percent of respondents looking for high yields, Tom, this year. You know, that just tells you where the consensus yeah. was coming it, into 2024. Where the consensus is, and I'm going to let you decide now at 4.04 4 percent. You know, where are we going to go on a three-ish basis? So is, the, is 375 or 360 the new 3.25 percent of just weeks ago? I mean, I think that's a really, really important point to say the least. Let's wrap it up with foreign exchange. Just a sneak peek of what's happening at the moment. The euro against the dollar looks a little something like this. Dollar strength, euro weakness, that currency pair negative 0.3%, 109.11. Under surveillance this morning, U.S. payrolls due out in two hours' time. Bloomberg survey of economists expecting a print of 175,000 and an uptick to the unemployment rate to about 3.8%. Bloomberg economics leads are expecting an increase of 140,000 jobs with gains mostly in government, healthcare, and the hospitality sectors. That's going to be a focus, I think, of this report, Lisa. Just a sector breakdown. How broad-based or narrow are these gains to jobs growth? I'm glad you went there and that you brought up Caro Kadana because if it all is coming from specific sectors that have to hire right now or government funding, which might not last considering some of the budgetary constraints, does this represent a strong market or is this a sign of weakening under the hood that people need to pay attention well, to? Well, 140 statistic there from Anna Wong and the team is, is germane. That's a slowdown, period. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Do you put a vector on it and get to where David Kelly is at J.P. Morgan of a negative non-farm payrolls report out there somewhere? I, even, even with a 140 number today, I don't think we can go there yet. I mean, there's been enough robustness. Where yeah, it's an, if, if we get a soggy data point, it's just that, soggy. Sarah House of Wells Fargo joining us in just a moment on that. An update on this story. Terrorist group ISIS claiming responsibility for an attack that killed more than 80 people in Iran this week. The attack coming as crowds gathered to mark the death of a top Iranian commander killed by the United States four years ago. Tom, tensions rising in the Middle East. Secretary of State Antony Blinken set for another round of shuttle diplomacy in the region. Think, I don't think there's enough airports to land in on shuttle diplomacy in, in the eastern Mediterranean. There's so much going on, as we mentioned, with Bobby Ghosh, with his just tangible expertise. This went to Baghdad. I mean, you, you know, you go to Iraq as well as Iran for death, murder of Iranian officials. So to me, it's, it's not just about single point diplomacy. It's a multitude of stops that Mr. Blinken has to make. We're seeing the disruption already to global trade. This story very much linked to what we're talking about in the Middle East. The latest update from Mask saying it's decided that all vessels due to transit the Red Sea will be diverted south around the Cape of Good Hope for the foreseeable future. Mask saying it's encouraging customers, quote, to prepare for complications, Lisa, in the area to persist and for there to be significant disruption to the global network. And there already has been some adjustment, but how much more has to happen? And this, to me, is actually a really significant story that has been, and it's been percolating in the background. It hasn't been talked about. But there was a story that came out yesterday that showed how much the cost to ship 
from Asia to Northern Europe it's has hockey skyrocketed. Stick. Hockey stick. Skyrocketed. Yeah. Increased 173% since December when the disruption started. How much further does it have to go if some of the consumers realize this yeah. isn't going to end anytime soon? And if Maersk thinks, well, we have to go this entire other route and hire all sorts of other yeah. people and stop in, you know, in, in Cape Town and let them get some, you know, fun or whatever, whatever the case may be, it's going to be more expensive. It's going to be hugely more expensive. And Maersk is a legitimate company here out of Copenhagen. And you know, with a legitimate double-digit shareholder return over the last decade. But, John, I'm sorry, EBITDA margin off the pandemic is giving way. How much more does it give away uh, is they have to go another 2,500 miles, Shanghai to New York? It's a massive question to ask here, Tom. How Houthi rebels have managed to basically shut down. That's the key thing. This trade channel. Stravitas has been way out front. And you've this. got way out some serious countries with a big military presence trying to prevent this from happening and seemingly they can't stop I it. I believe I saw from the Pentagon yesterday, I'm making this up, folks, it's jobs they were allowed to do that. Um, I believe I saw 20 or 21 countries involved in an allied effort within the Red Sea. And the only one from the Middle East is Bahrain, which is interesting because there are U.S. military bases there, but Saudi Arabia, Qatar, all of the others are not involved in trying to prevent this. Yeah. It just sort of highlights, and I got to say, the fact that ISIS <coughs> came onto the scene from nowhere, seemingly, with his attack really highlights what a tinderbox the Middle East is right now yeah. and how much you cannot predict with any linearity what's going to happen. Our Washington team will follow Secretary Blinken's travels here uh, through uh, the weekend. Joining us now on this Jobs Friday, Sarah House. Senior economist at Wells Fargo. Open question with all the heritage of Jay Bryson and John Sylvia and uh, Wells Fargo. Sarah House, what is your key attribute in the jobs report at 8.30? So I think we'll be looking at not just that overall rate of hiring, but I think looking more under the surface given this juncture of the of the cycle. So as you guys were discussing previously, you know, what's the breadth of job growth? Is it being driven by just a few industries the way we have the way we have seen it over the past six months or so, or are we seeing some stabilization? Because I think that's one of the the cracks that we're seeing underneath the surface of what's still a pretty decent rate of of hiring, but uh, underneath that surface, we, we are mm -hmm. seeing some signs of concerns that make us uh, worried about the sustainability of, of the jobs expansion that we've seen thus right. far. Surveillance pro tip, John Farrell writes my questions. He puts them in the teleprompter and he's doing that right now. What matters on average hourly earnings? John Farrell wants me to ask, is it month over month or year over year? So I think it's it's year over year and also three month annualized, I think is probably the more salient point right now, just given that inflation is still very much a, a concern. And I think that's really driving the, the Fed's decisions right now. So I think what's happening in, in that more recent pace. So there's, of course, a lot of volatility in those average hourly earnings month to month, even with that three month annualized rate. But it at least gives you a more recent look than that year over year number, which tends to be a little bit smoother. But at the end of the day, this is just one data point on on wages and arguably it's it's not the most important it is the most timely but i think we see the the fed and other policymakers give much more weight to the employment cost numbers we're swapping questions this morning sarah tom wants to know about the quirks of december talk to us about the quirks of december just how reliable is that jobless claims number we got in the last 24 hours how reliable would this data be a little bit later this morning yeah, so with the jobless claims number, so of course seasonality is a huge issue this time of year, but even when you look at the non-seasonally adjusted numbers, they're running comfortably below the levels that we saw in 2017, 2018, 2019. And so I think it's pretty clear that layoffs remain low, but where we get concerned about is, well, what's happening on the other side? What's happening with those new hires? And we saw that with the JOLTS report, those gross hires coming down to the, the lowest rate since 2014. So while the the jobless claims numbers, I think, are, are genuinely showing low layoffs, that there's still some concerns about the pace of hiring. You ask about some of the quirks of December particularly, I think you will still get likely somewhat of a boost from the end of strikes coming from Mack Trucks, the, the casino strike in, in Detroit. And so you're still seeing some noise with that. Seasonals around holiday hiring is also um, can also be pretty difficult this time of year. So there's still going to be some noise in, in the December payroll numbers as well. That said, Sarah, is there going to be anything that could give credence from an economic perspective to Fed rate cuts in March? 
Well, I think if you see overall a, a faster weakening in terms of the, the payroll numbers, so if you get something you know, comfortably below c consensus, if you see also I think those, those wage numbers also indicating that uh, that those labor costs continue continue to slow on trend. I think maybe that could could boost the possibility. But I think when you look at where the Fed is right now, there really isn't that consensus for for a March rate cut. And so I think that still looks a bit early in our view. You know, if you look at some of the major data points, including today, we'll get three three payrolls reports, three CPI, but only two PCE uh, reports. And so I think there's there's still some concern that well, we've seen a lot of progress on inflation. Can can that, can that be sustained? I remember last year, Sarah, when people were laughing at the Fed's projections of where unemployment rates were going to end up, even with this disinflation. And actually, those unemployment rates were too high, given what we've seen so far. And I'm just wondering whether you buy into this idea that we could end up with a 4.1 percent unemployment rate, which is up just a touch from where we are now, and get inflation back down to 2 percent by the end of this year. So we're a little bit more pessimistic on the unemployment side. So we think unemployment will be closer to, to four and a half percent by the end of the year. But we also think that inflation is probably going to be a bit lower than than what the Fed expects. So closer to about 2.2 percent by by the end of next year. So I think you're still getting some benefits of just the normalization of of supply chains, uh, the housing housing softness feeding through to to the official numbers as well. So that's helping in addition to I think just the broader dampening in the demand picture that we're expecting in the months ahead. Off the jobs report, what's your GDP call for now, Q4, and also for all of 2024? Yeah, so for so for Q4, we're still looking for a, a, a pretty marked moder moderation, so somewhere closer to one percent. And for full wow. year 2024, we're also looking for somewhere closer to to one percent, but that's not going to be even throughout the year. So we still have a, a mild recession in our forecast, where we think there's a good chance that we'll get uh, at least you know one, maybe two negative quarters around around mid year. So that's that's weighing down that that average that we're expecting for both. The the fourth quarter and you know still seeing still seeing growth here in, in Q1. Sarah just to recap just quickly which month have you got penciled in for that first cut from the Federal Reserve? So right now we have a, a June cut, but I think just given that the inflation data has uh, come in a little bit lower than than expected, and then I think just the Fed's thinking has changed a little bit. They seem to be more comfortable with not only where rates are now, but where they are beginning to have that conversation around when the the Fed when they do eventually cut. I'd say the risks are probably skewed a, a, towards towards somewhat earlier than than that call. It right certainly now. feels that way, Sarah. Thanks for the update. Appreciate it. Happy New Year. Sarah House there of Wells Fargo on the data that comes out in a couple of hours' time later this morning. Payrolls coming up very shortly. And the Federal Reserve. Next move, the call from Wells Fargo, Tom. June, penciling in that first rate cut, but ultimately the risk that it comes sooner. Two things, two reasons. One is the data, but also the Fed's thinking around that data. Tom, things have shifted in the last few months. Yeah, I think the Fed parlor game's in full swing right now. And you're right, it shifted into the point we heard earlier, the revisions today are maybe as important as the actual uh, job statistic, the non-farm payroll statistic that we see. I'm way more focused, John, right now, away from the Fed story towards the real economy story. And for Sarah House to state there, a 1% Q4 GDP, that's a tepid statistic. 1% GDP Q4, I don't know what percent of America that puts into agony, but it's a large number. This at a time when I keep having one eye to this potential supply shock. I mean, how did they respond? I just want to go back to the Maersk story. I keep thinking about it. Maybe it's just because I'm being overdramatic. But to me, the idea that shipping costs are going to increase for the foreseeable future and potentially could increase significantly more as they reroute in this really massive way, you have to, you have to pay attention to that. That affects costs of goods, which have been one of the main inputs to the disinflation that we've seen. We'll return to that news a little bit later this morning. Just to focus on the payrolls number, fantastic lineup later this morning, 8.45 Eastern time. We'll get the latest from Bill Dudley, the Bloomberg Opinion columnist and former New York Fed president to respond to the economic data. And TK, a column a little bit earlier this week on bank regulation. We'll make some time for that a little bit later too. Every word was of value. It was a blistering essay from the former head of the New York uh, Fed. And, and, and John, I'm sorry. It's a really important column. 
about whether there's still risks of the broader American banking system. That analysis about two hours away. The jobs report just around the corner. The median estimate in our survey, 175,000. The price action has been week, week, week to start the new year. Four day losing streak on the S&P this morning. We're down 0.3. Trend signals have finally turned long, and I think this is an epic signal for the market because we have been short for nine quarters. This has been one of the longest shorts in trend following history over the last 20 to 40 years. And I think this is important because it signals the end of the tightening cycle and it suggests that we're going through a regime change and that we need to start looking at the next phase of the bond market. Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex, the final two months of that last quarter, super painful, big move lower in 10-year yields. Your 10-year yield this morning shaping up as follows. Your 10-year yield a little bit higher and back through 4%, 4.03. 8.1% on the week, yields higher by about 16 basis points. Worth framing it over the last couple of months, though. The 10-year yield was lower by more than 60 basis points in November, down close to 45 in December. And Tom, just encouraged by some better than expected data to start the new year, yields pushing in the other direction. Oh, yeah, and over 4%. And I guess, you know, we're hugely data dependent. And again, you know, how important is JP Morgan earnings? I mean, over, one week the, away. over the holiday, one week away, and, and they were saying they, they're capturing one out of five profit dollars in American banking. Maybe that's as big as the jobs report. To see At the moment, I doing. think the big number, TK, is yeah. the one from Apple. Early February, start of the year, in two the unit sales hysteria, big China, run up, yeah. big run up through yeah. 2023, a lot of more multiple right. expansion, sales of the iPhone, not great. We we'll see what the quarter looks like. And, and to their credit, they write a blisteringly clear report when it comes out. I mean, they, they're, they're, they're PR staff, they're IR staff. Right? They get an A from they, you. They get an A from me for clarity. Like you can actually read the thing. One of the things you can read is Anna Wong's economic literature, chief US economist at Bloomberg Economics. Every report is at least 42 pages long, except when she stops traffic in tweets. Anna Wong joins now from Bloomberg Economics. You stopped me yesterday, Dr. Wong, with a spectacular tweet with the Anna Wong famous red pencil on the birth death study of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We now go wonky on jobs day. Anna Wong, do we actually know what our job numbers are or are they judged, are they changed by the births and the deaths in America? Yeah, so, um, you know, the BLS um, adjusts their uh, each month's survey number with an, a model estimated uh, re result uh, from a model called birth death model that aims to capture the job growth of small firms. And those uh, estimations are based on benchmark um, results from a year ago. So what oftentimes happens is when you have turning points in the economy, you have a lot of uh, volatilities with uh, new firms firms and bankruptcies. As we did see in 2023, we had right. um, elevated uh, bankruptcy rates. And that's when the birth and death model tends to overestimate the amount of job growth. And in 2023, 42% of the non-farm payroll gains is due to the estimated increase of jobs in the birth and death model. So I think it's open to, indeed, um, um, you know, people's skeptic skepticism on okay, whether... But they're, right. Yeah. And we're getting tons of emails on this, that the job numbers are not nearly as rosy as people like you are telling us. Now, you're at 140,000, so you're already beneath the survey for today. Are we going to sit here in March or July or November next year and say, oops, everybody got the small business birth death model wrong and the American labor economy is a lot weaker than we knew? Well, I think the most important is what the Fed thinks. And I think the Fed is aware of the flaws with the birth and death model. And they actually do think that the, uh, the, the real situation is weaker than what the job number thinks. So my tweet yesterday is actually coming from the Fed's 
a green book back in 2001. So yes, there are the Fed is totally aware that the situation is not as rosy. And so this is why in turning points of the economy, the Fed tends to focus more on anecdotes and what their business context t told them. And I think one of the key reasons for last December's Powell dovish pivot was because they put a, a lot more weight on what the district uh, contacts have been telling them, and that was reflected in the Beige Book, which was the most downbeat Beige Book uh, since 2020 in November 2023. Anecdotally, Anna, though, we've seen a lot of pessimism. The sentiment has been really, really uh, underwater for a while, and yet the economy has overperformed again and again, surprised everybody, a lot of people who were expecting recession last year, including yourself. Why have the numbers not cohered at all with that, why do we think that they're going to show something different this time around? Yeah, you know, I, I think that I, I think it's uh, it's not clear at all that the economy did not slip into a recession in the last three months of last year yet. Um, I think in terms of uh, if the narrative is that GDP number is very strong, well, it turns out that in the in the quarter before the 2007 December MBER. Uh, recession de declaration, GDP was also running at 4.9%. And in fact, the MBER business dating committee themselves recognize that GDP is actually not a very good real-time measure on what's really going on with the economy. On the other hand, if you look at, um, you know, CapEx intentions and also um, what the Fed regional surveys is describing the economic conditions to be, it was actually quite weak. Um, so for what matters to um, how the Fed get their information, what, how much weight they place on the incoming data, I would say at this point, when you have a turning point, you put a lot more weight on what your business contacts are telling you. And uh, I think right now, I, I still see that the reason for why we think uh, possibly a, some recessionary dynamics had begun in actually October of 2023, I think all the reasons are still there. If that's the case, if we already have seen the start of a recession, does that mean that we're almost out of it, that we're almost to the recovery because basically people are already kind of reshaping around a new post-pandemic economic reality? Yeah, um, that's a very fair point. So our, our view is that uh, one of the key uh, uh, reason for a soft landing or a very, very mild recession is if the Fed comes to the rescue early, if the Fed cuts rate early and fast. And, you know, our uh, using some state-of-the-art model, we found that Powell's pivot in December is equivalent to 13 percentage point rate cuts. So there you have it. You don't need to wait for the rate cut in whether it be March or May, but it de facto, the uh, pivot by Powell in December already is equivalent to half of a rate cut. And that could certainly make this recession extremely mild and very short. The market's been cutting rates for them. Anna, thank you. Appreciate the update. Anna Wong there of Bloomberg Economics. And a happy new year to you as well, Anna. That jobs data, just around the corner, the estimate 175,000. TK, I think it's hard to get your head around this. When you hear people talk about recessionary dynamics beginning and jobless claims that are around 200,000, unemployment south of 4%, at least it is at the moment. We'll get an update on that a little bit later this morning. And we're talking about jobs growth of 175. It's bizarre if you, know, you, you parachuted in from 20 years ago, you'd say, you've got to be kidding me. It's, it's completely pandemic-induced, stimulus-induced. But the thing I would go to, John, and... It shows the confusion of the birth death study that Anna Wanning is brilliant on, truly extraordinary work by Dr. Wong, and that is the technology overlay right now. Anybody who tells me they have any certitude on what the technology impact is on America right now, I, I'm just going to ignore them. Nobody has a clue. The optimists would say that real no. wage growth is improving. Lisa, you remember the outlook from Goldman, Jan Hatzius and the team? Lisa, they were talking about the tailwinds for 2024 and the hard part being over. 
The optimists would say that we had a rolling recession. It rolled through a lot of different places. The averages didn't show it, show it, and now we've got the recovery on the way. And this sort of is, where are we in the cycle? Are we at the end of the last one, or are we already at the beginning of the new one with people projecting out a lot of strength this year? I mean, this is some of the uh, discussion point. And then you throw in a number. What do the numbers mean anymore if you're trying to cobble together all of these different rolling economic cycles of specific industries? Between goods and services, et cetera, et cetera. All questions we'll ask at 8.30 Eastern time when this number drops. The number we're looking for, 175,000. Priya Misra of JP Morgan Asset Management will give us a preview in about five minutes' time. This is how the market's set up for you. You're all familiar with the moves over the last few days. Four-day losing streak on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, a five-day losing streak. On the Nasdaq, incidentally, the longest daily losing streak through the whole of the last year, all the way back, Tom, to late 2022. We have not had a five-day losing oh. streak on the NASDAQ 100 for that long. I saw one survey that had a series that was back to, I believe it was 1978. I mean, there's some real carnage here as well. We're going to keep the coverage going here, John. you got to do this because in the next five minutes, i got to try to figure out what the FA Cup is in London. Tots are playing Burnley. I have no idea. How many times have FA we explained Cup this? Is. How many times have we explained it? Why do they have so many leagues? This Why is don't how he's prepping. Big for jobs day. <laughs> it's not a league. Burnley? It's not a league. It's a cup. It's a you cup. You know this. <laughs> the thing that gives me the most anxiety is perhaps a cut that comes too soon from central banks. Markets are expecting that they could move as soon as the next couple of months. We think that that will be too soon. We should be thinking about whether or not they'll have to restart the rate hike cycle. I don't think we're at an inflection point at the moment. Trend signals have finally turned long. It signals the end of the tightening cycle, and it suggests that we're going through a regime change. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. TK, big question. What's your hangover cure? What's your go-to? <laughs> A morning martini. No. Inquiring minds um, want to know. No, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't really have one because I'm very careful. Tang. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm tang. careful. Tang. But I tang, ask this because the, tang uh, is the, start. the New Year Should hangover raise... continues in the market. It does. Do you like it that? Does. Well, from New York City this morning. <laughs> it's nice to give Good me. morning, good morning. I was expecting better than that. For our audience <laughs> yeah. worldwide, this is Bloomberg tang. Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. And Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P, negative by a quarter of 1%. You know the numbers now, four-day losing streak on the S&P, five days on the Nasdaq 100. The losses, TK, just building to start the new year. Well, they are in the equity markets. You're seeing it, and it's, it's where we were saying earlier, two, three days down, you hit support. Well, guess what? On many cases, it's not just Apple. We're going through support, or if the series is going the other way through resistance. Uh, something as nuanced, John, as Swiss franc, I have continued through the week persistent bid on Swiss franc just as one global example of how the first couple of days have been ugly. There's a new number to look at as well. It's got a four in front of it on the 10-year. 4.036 percent. Yields up this morning by four basis points. Lisa, it's about payrolls today, 175 the estimate. But yesterday the data was decent, pushed yields higher. It's about crowded trades and people unwinding some of those. And one of the crowded trades was that the Federal Reserve was going to cut rates pretty aggressively this year in response to weak economic data. The data has not been particularly weak, and so people have to retrace that. How far do they have to retrace that if we get a better than expected number today? That's the data. We need to talk about some risk in the Middle East as well. An update from the container shipping giant AP Molomers, Tom, saying it's decided that all vessels due to transit through the Red Sea will be diverted around the Cape of Good Hope for the foreseeable future. That update, Tom, in the last hour. Yeah, the foreseeable part is, is, is there. It's very tangible and, you know, we walk through it. It's a 2,500 mile extension on the trip China to New York. But, you know, I, I, I just, I, I wonder what it actually means versus the absolute miracle that is the Suez Canal and has been a miracle for decades and decades and decades. And Mike Shepard of Bloomberg joining us in about 10 minutes from Washington, D.C. Look out for that conversation. Here are the scores to start your morning. Here's the price action on the S&P 500. Negative 0.2%. Talked about yields going higher by four basis points. Back through 4% in the FX market off the back of that. Push it through foreign exchange. Lease the dollar strength against the euro. 109. 
16. Basically everything on its head from the end of last year. What we're watching for today, obviously the big deal. 8.30 a.m., as Tom says, the Super Bowl non-farm payrolls report for December, the last one for 2023 at a time where a lot of the labor market data has been coming in stronger than expected. 175,000 is the estimate. What I'm watching is average hourly earnings. If they increase by 3.9% as expected, is this good enough for a Federal Reserve cutting rates as soon as March? 10 a.m., we get ISM services data. The services sector continues to be strong. It's been an expansion territory for about a year. It's been actually an expansion territory if you take out one month since May of 2020. Can that continue? And at 1.30 p.m., we hear from Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, who's spoken a couple of times this week. We also, I'm glad to say, have a number of former Fed officials who are going to be joining us today, including Randy Crosner and Bill Dudley, to give us their perhaps unfiltered thoughts. It's always nice to get the former officials. Bramo, I'm with you. TK, they always seem to say what they really think. Oh, yeah. Less guarded <clears throat> than the current Fed officials. And you see their academic distinctions as well, and that includes Dr. Dudley and all the work he did at Berkeley years ago. Bill Dudley, 8.45 Eastern Time. With us right now around the table here in New York, I'm pleased to say, Priya Misra, Portfolio Manager at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Priya, good morning and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. Thanks for having me. Fantastic to see you on this Payrolls Friday again. Let's start with Payrolls. What are you and the team looking for? How do you expect this bond market to respond to it? So, uh, you know, we're looking for uh, sort of this 170, 180 number. I think, uh, you know, the market's probably a little bit overdone or was overdone into the end of the year. What we're seeing is sort of this pullback. I actually think the uh, the risks are somewhat asymmetric. If we get another strong number, if, if we get a high average hourly earnings number, this narrative that, it, that this immaculate disinflation has, uh, uh, you know, will essentially allow the Fed to cut rates as early as March, I think that gets pared back. So interest rates can rise. I think we get a bigger reaction to a very strong number. But I will say, you know, we're in a very interesting time. We're in this inflection point. The Fed has clearly done in terms of rating, uh, in, in, in terms of how much they're going to raise rates. When do they start to cut? How much do they cut? Are they normalizing? Are they easing? We're in this very tenuous period, which is why the market's going to be volatile. I think this year is about significant uncertainty. Today's number might just suggest that the economy is continuing to normalize, but not weak enough for the Fed to start to cut early. So I think we're going to remain extremely Whippy. It's about positioning. It's about the fact that in the last two months, we went from 5% on the 10-year to 380. So I think we, we are sort of consolidating here. I actually think anything above 4% is an attractive level to own if you own risk assets. That correlation is going to come back because it's all about when does the, how quickly can the Fed try and get that soft landing. How big is the spread between what you think the Fed will do and what you think they should do? I ask because, as you know, your colleague is in the FT this morning, Bob Michael, saying the Fed should cut probably now to get ahead of the next shock. Is there a big, a big spread between what you think they will do and what they should do? I think there is a big spread because it's all about how restrictive is policy right now. I think, you know, in our view, real rates, long and real rates are clearly in restrictive territory. <clears throat> Are we seeing that in the data just yet? No, no. I would say we're seeing cracks in the data. We're nervous that these cracks are going to deepen, which is why the Fed should actually remove that restriction, start to at least to get to neutral. But the Fed, I think, wants to really put that inflation genie back in the bottle. And inflation has been surprising to the downside. We were in this immaculate disinflation, but it's not going to be a straight line down. You see European inflation starting to come a little higher. And I think that's going to make right. the Fed a little nervous. So I think there is that big gap. The longer that gap increases between what the Fed, when the Fed should start to cut, how quickly they cut, I think the odds of a hard landing start to increase. We don't do Cartesian geometry on jobs day, but the answers to your point is the real yield is hugely extended. I looked at the two-year real yield and was stunned at the something fancy folks called the integrand. And the answer is, what's the urgency for the Fed to get the 10-year real yield down and give us a level where we begin to see that. At a 170, do we need to get to 150 fast to provide some comfort, some ease? I think it would help. I, th I would say closer to 1% on 10-year. To 1.00? 10 I would say that's the level you sort of Gosh, need. She's just I mean, great entertainment. Are you kidding me? A 1.00? Well, I think that's the level that's the neutral level. If the Fed really wants to ease, they have to go below that. Are we going to get there anytime soon? Not with QT, not with the fact that inflation's not heading all the way down to 2%. And I think you really need either QT to stop or at least start to spare back. They've started to talk about it, but they're not close to getting that done. Or the Fed actually starting to talk about cutting rates. I think the struggle the Fed has is the moment they start, the market's going to price in all the way down to 
two percent, two and a half percent, and the Fed really wants to nuance that message and say, no, we're only cutting to normalize, to reduce restrictiveness. The messaging problem, I think, is going to make the Fed slow in terms of trying to bring those to, uh, you know, long in real rates lower. But yeah, I think you need close to that one percent. Look at housing affordability, or look at when, you know, you know just, the, Lisa. If she gets this wrong, she's going in the basement over at the new building on Park Avenue. Well, <laughs> That's a bold call from Priya. Misra. Just to sort of give it some perspective, the two-year real yield is currently close to 2.4 percent. So that's a pretty big decline uh, if this were to transpire. This is all coming at a time where you're saying they want to see that disinflation. They want to put the inflation genie back in the bottle. You pointed to Europe. And I think that it's important to take a look at why inflation reignited. It's because oil costs surged. There, some of the subsidies rolled off. Some of the subsidies just in general and some of the government fueled injections also rolling off. How much is that going to be a problem for the Fed if, let's say, supply chain disruption spurs inflation, if the Middle East in an oil shock spurs inflation? Is that going to be enough to keep them from cutting rates, even if that's not good for the economy? Right. I, I think they're going to look at the, the, the labor market, which is where today's average early earnings number is going to be important. If that number is sticky on the way down, I actually think then the supply chain issues, even though it's not good for the consumer, I think it's going to, if it keeps inflation elevated, they really want to get inflation trending close to that 2% and can slow them down. Now, I think the Fed will say when we start to cut, we can cut a lot faster. So they can always, you know, go faster once they start. But I think if you have geopolitical risk, I think it's something we're dealing with multiple wars, you know, this is what's happening in the, in the Red Sea, that can just make the Fed a little reluctant to start to cut unless the labor market starts to slow down. And it's not slowing down fast enough, I think, for the Fed to be concern about wages. So what's the threshold? If you put some numbers on it, given the fact that people are expecting 175,000 for the non-farm payrolls number that we get in about an hour and 20 minutes, what, how low would it have to be to trigger real concern from the Fed regardless of inflation? I think around 100,000 would be that, that level because that's the level at which point the unemployment rate starts to rise. And the Fed knows that inflation is a lagging indicator. If you get close to 100, that implies that, you know, wages are going to start to come down. And I think that's when the Fed says, OK, this is not normalizing. This is, you know, maybe the lags are finally taking effect. So I think that's the level in terms of payrolls. And I think for wages, you need something in that three and a half percent average early earnings over a three to six month annualized pace. I think that's the level where they'll say, OK, maybe we have more faith that the inflation genie is sort of heading back into the bottle. What are the chances of a pickup in growth again, a reacceleration? after the massive easing of financial conditions we've had in the last couple of months. I think that has to be a concern for the Fed, but I would still go back to real rates, to Tom's point. If real rates in the long end are that high, I don't know if it re-accelerates growth. It can slow down how quickly things are slowing. The fact that financial conditions have eased can offset these high real rates. I do struggle with the re-acceleration narrative. I think we're debating how quickly are things slowing down. Are they slowing down enough to that threshold question that the Fed can afford to their really trying to get that soft landing. I think they can see that path and they're trying to get there. Will the market and inflation allow them to do that? It's off your remit, but I'm going there. With your bold call of dramatically lower real rates, what's it do inside two years? What's it do to the LIBOR, the SOFR market? I mean, basically, it's a refinancialization of finance, isn't it, with a gift of low real rates? Well, I think the, the low real rates I'm talking about is more look further out. Once yeah, the I mean, Fed that's your job. I get that. But, you know, no one's listening. It's just it's job's day. Stay with me here, Priya. Come on. Inside, if we get a Priya Misra world, we refinancialize our finance system. It's a gift. We get, re, you know, we get SOFA rates then close to, in a soft landing, close to... 250, 275 in a hard landing. And do we get that? I think the markets run away with this thesis that here, soft landing, here we come. But if the lags are kicking in, if those real rates are going to force you know, things to slow down, as everyone who's been locked into these low real rates starts to refinance and realizes those real rates are high, that those SOFA rates then are going below 2%. That's not wow. priced in at all. My takeaway this morning from you, you think this four year, this four percent yield right now and this 10 year is a buy? I think it's a buy. I think we scale back a little bit below four percent because the data is not weak enough. But I think you get four, anything north of four. We're not going above 420, I would argue, because that's the level where the Fed said we're done. Essentially, that's what they told us in December. And the bar to cut is not that high. So I think that's the level anywhere between four and 4.2, I would say is a buy. Interesting. Priya, great to see you. 
Happy New Year. Looking ahead to the year ahead. Priya Mishra there of JP Morgan Asset Management. <laughs> if you aren't just joining us on this payrolls Friday, you hear the scores on the S&P 500. Equity futures negative here by a quarter of 1%. Yields are a little bit higher by three basis points, 4.0325%. We need to be talking about what's happening in the Middle East. And what isn't happening, Lisa, the latest from shipping giant AP Molomesk. For the foreseeable future, they are going to reroute away from the Red Sea. And we're seeing already since December when some of these uh, reroutings began, a huge surge in the cost of shipping, a huge surge in the cost of insuring some of these container ships. So here's the question. Does this materially cause any kind of inflation? Does this materially cause some kind of supply shock that suddenly re re uh, reignites some memories of the pandemic? How much does this have a real effect on the economy at a time when we're focused on jobs, we're focused on metrics that already have been muddied by the pandemic? Bloomberg's Mike Shepard just moments away down in Washington, D.C. to get you up to speed on that story. In just about an hour from now, Nadia Lovell of UBS, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, looking ahead to the jobs report and the year ahead for equities. The UBS view is just around a corner. The payrolls report just around a corner as well. 175, the estimate in our survey from New York City this morning. Good morning. Personally, think President Trump was the right president at the right time. I agree with a lot of his policies. But the reality is, rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. And we can't have a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. If you've run before, promised things, didn't deliver, and then you're running on the same things, uh, wouldn't it be reasonable to say, well, gee, I don't know that I can take that to the bank going forward. So, yes, I think the fact that he's campaigning on something, uh, that does not mean that he would actually follow through on it. That was presidential candidate Nikki Haley, Governor Ron DeSantis speaking yesterday in back-to-back -back town halls on CNN. Both candidates <coughs> taking game at the former president. From New York City with payrolls about an hour and 15 minutes away, here's the state of play. Equity futures negative again. We're down a quarter of 1% on a four-day losing streak through Thursday on the S&P 500 and on a nine-week winning streak on the S&P and Lisa well on course to snapping that a little bit later on this afternoon. So here's the question, right? Do we end up seeing a trend that really can follow through the rest of the year, or is this just people resetting after a blockbuster last couple of months to the year? And honestly, I don't have a clear answer. We have the likes uh, of Phil Camparelli who came on and said, ah, he's still bullish. This is just normal volatility, which basically means a little selling and then you buy. The boat is so loaded to the one side coming into 2024, looking for rate cuts, that a little bit of better data, Tom, <laughs> just pushes things the other way. And we've seen that in the last 24 hours. Yields up again, up three basis points yeah. today on a 10-year, back through 4%. Well, the, and the tape is showing it. I mean, the equity tape is a little bit soggy here as well. Maybe we're waiting for 8.30 this morning, but the fact is it's day after day, and when do you get a turn? I thought we had a turn yesterday. Uh-uh. Didn't work out. I mean, just plain and simple. It didn't work out yeah. at all. Just the weakness continues. Phenomenal <clears throat> to see the Nasdaq on this five-day run five-day losing streak and it's the longest since 22 right. which i think speaks more to the strength of last year than it does the weakness of 2024 tom just last year was absolutely phenomenal i mean it's interesting and with after that incredible interview with priya misra of jp morgan the 10-year real yield market down 1.7955 rounded up to 1.80 misra looking for substantially lower inflation adjusted yields Today's an August day. It happens every four years where I actually read a memo on the Iowa caucuses. I like what PBS says. PBS says, are both the Republicans and Democrats holding caucuses in Iowa this year? And the PBS answer is sort of, providing us with wisdom this morning on the political season. Michael Shepard, driving all of our U.S. government coverage for Bloomberg News. Michael, I love the sort of of it. Give us some clarity. I'm biased to the New Hampshire primary. Give us the so what on the Iowa caucuses. Iowa matters even more this year, Tom, and thank you for having me, than before because this is where Donald Trump, who has been running his campaign as an incumbent among the Republican field, is looking to score a decisive victory to put Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis far in the rearview mirror. And he will need that from a state that he has ties to from his prior administration. When he was in office, his ambassador to China, one of his top targets during his years in office, was a former governor 
governor of Iowa. And he had other people, including an acting attorney general, who are now active in helping him in his comeback bid. How is it that we have a nation's incumbency in the Republican Party decided by 12 people sitting around a fireplace in somebody's living room? I, I mean, it's January. Is he really going to wrap it up that early, even to say he's going to wrap it up in New Hampshire? Well, the way that Trump has worked with the Republican Party to set up the rules, Tom, over the past year for all the primaries through the course of 2024 has worked to his advantage. So if he scores a big win here, it builds up momentum. And even if Nikki Haley keeps it close in New Hampshire, by the time we get to a lot of the other states, it will be much harder for her or Ron DeSantis to make up that lost ground and pick up the delegates that they would need to secure the nomination. And to be fair, in Iowa, it is more than just a handful of people huddled around a fireplace. There were bigger meetings there. And a number of people in the state will turn out. They're very actively engaged in the state's politics. We've had reporters out there over the uh, course of the past several months, including in December, and we'll all be out there in force with our Bloomberg teams again to find out what's on voters' minds. And two things that we're hearing, one, of course, is the economy, but the other is also immigration and border security. And That's those are things that Donald Trump is using to his advantage in this campaign. We'll get to immigration in a second, but with the economy, we are going to get a jobs report today. We've been talking about why people have been so pessimistic, given that the economy has actually been performing pretty well. I mean, the expansion in December was pretty significant. What's the explanation for both the Republican side and the Democratic side for the disparity between the official numbers and how people are feeling? That's a great question, Lisa. I'm glad you asked it because we have been looking at this ourselves in our Bloomberg Morning Consult poll of the seven swing states that we think are going to be decisive in figuring out the election outcome in November. What we are finding is that people do not trust President Joe Biden on the economy. They're disappointed and they are concerned about where the national economy is going. They are feeling unease and they say they trust Donald Trump more by, near, by a nearly 20 point per percentage point margin to handle the economy. And the, you can look at it this way. When you go to the grocery store, while we see our reports that inflation is easing, those prices for goods like milk and eggs and cheese still remain high from what people remember, say, three or four years ago. There was a story in the New York Times that really caught my attention because people say this is unprecedented to see this sort of disparity uh, between how people feel and the overall economy. They pointed to uh, Harry Truman in 1948 in the election when he was looking at a north of 7 percent inflation rate, but also sub 4 percent unemployment rate and talked also about how frustrated people felt and how, how they actually would have been willing to take a pay cut rather than see some of their prices continue to rise in the grocery stores. How similar is now to then versus the 1970s and a very different kind of time? Well, you know, it's such a different economy that it's really hard to make a clean comparison. But there are elements that really carry over. And certainly for the Biden team, it is a huge source of frustration. They have been trying to pitch their uh, successes in getting the president's uh, domestic agenda passed within his first two years in office. That included a big infrastructure package, the Inflation Reduction Act, which brought all these big subsidies and, and initiatives to promote uh, construction of new elect, uh, electric cars. And and they are not seeing any reward from that. The, the whole Bidenomics pitch has fallen flat with voters. The herd and cats at the moment, Mike. Let's finish on this. Foreign policy and international security. We've got these issues in the Red Sea. We've been talking about the latest from AP Molomers this morning. It doesn't feel like it even features, Mike. It just keeps coming back to domestic security, the southern border. Is that the story at the moment in this campaign? The southern border really is emerging as a major issue. And we saw earlier this week House Speaker Mike Johnson heading to Texas, along with 60 of his Republican colleagues, to visit the border and see what's going on there and then use that as uh, ammunition in their argument to President Joe Biden and to Democrats in Congress for tougher border measures. And they have been using that to hold up aid to Ukraine for months. Uh, President Joe Biden asked for a $60 billion assistance package for Kiev. Uh, that was back in October. Uh, and we still have not seen action by Congress to pass that and get that through. That's been frustrating to the president, but even more so uh, worrisome for Ukraine. Uh, the president of uh, Ukraine was 
here in December trying to make his case uh, and to no avail. And this is raising concerns that America might be losing its will in something that President Joe Biden had called very important, and that is making sure Russia uh, was uh, held to account for its invasion of Ukraine and, uh, and to help Ukraine as much as possible in expelling that invasion. The fighting continues. Mike, appreciate the update. Michael Shepard there of Bloomberg down in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Mike. It's E.K. There are many issues. It's like herding cats right now for this administration. But the southern border quickly becoming one of I, the big issues for 2024. I can't remember the date, the December 27th, December 24th. I really can't remember. But I'm with Greg Vellier at AGF on this. There is no other issue. And you hear it from Republicans and particularly, and of course, folks in Manhattan, we hear this from Mayor Adams, but you hear this from Democrat, city, mayors, there's a different tone in their voice. Lisa are asking the right question on this payrolls Friday. We're talking about a number of 175k and you ask people how they feel about this economy, how they feel about this labour market. It doesn't speak to those headline numbers we're looking for in about an hour and five minutes. Coming up next, Sarah Wolf of Morgan Stanley with an hour to go until the payrolls report in our survey. The number we're looking for, the median estimate, 175K. Sarah's joining us next. Your equity market's lower. We're negative 0.2%. Coming into the new year, coming into this week, we were on a nine-week winning streak on the S&P 500, the longest weekly winning streak going back to 2004. We're about to snap it based on the price action of the previous four days on the S&P 500. Negative, 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 four-day losing streak, down five on the Nasdaq 100. We're negative 0.2% this morning on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 0.3. The Russell, the small cap suffering, Lisa, we're down about 0.8%. It's a reversal of what we saw at the end of last year, but there's this real tension right now. Can you see a rotation with some of the pressure that we've seen so far? People were saying, yeah, you could see a sell-off in big tech, but you could still see that rotation, that broadening out. Eh, I don't think so. That's sort of what we've seen. Well, we're seeing a rotation uh, out, but I, I'm sorry. The jobs report and the revisions today, I think, will fold right into the market. And people are the, the, the bulls are desperate for some optimism here. Maybe they get it. You get the 140 and a Wong number. You get 110 with revisions rounded out to 150, say, and that's the tendency in the right direction to keep the song and dance going. So far, not great. We're turning the end of 2023 upside down in equities and bonds as well. Big rally in the bond market, November, December, unwinding some of that to kick off January 2024. Yields are up again by three or four basis points. The 10-year through 4%, 4.03% on a two-year, up a couple of basis points. Lisa, let's call it 441 this morning on a two-year. What I think is interesting, I keep thinking about this, Priya Misra is saying that it's basically a buying opportunity any time that the 10-year yield is between 4 and 4.2%. Uh, percent. And a lot of this coming with this idea that it will be a 60-40 kind of ballast, once again, the kind of idea that Phil Camparelli was talking about. It's just an interesting moment that seems to be a, a real shift at a time when uh, we're sort of recalibrating after a strong last year. The data so far has been better than expected. Upside surprise on ADP, the right <coughs> kind of downside surprise on jobless claims. Whatever that's worth, December data, I get it. But it's pushing the market in the other direction. So take the bond market, push it through foreign exchange, yields up, dollar stronger against the euro. We're negative 0.3%, 109 16. That's the price action. Here are your top stories. Under surveillance this morning, an hour away from the jobs data in the US. Wall Street's big banks out with their estimates. JP Morgan coming in at the low end, forecasting a gain of 150,000 jobs. Goldman and City at the top, looking for a print of 190K. Sarah Wolf and the team at Morgan Stanley expecting a figure close to 180,000. Sarah's going to join us in just a moment on that. But TK, you can see the big banks on Wall Street grouping somewhere around 150 to 190. 150, the whisper number maybe is higher. But I, now I'm going to go again. The revisions are absolutely vital here. And then I'm going to take a three-month moving average and to see if we have a tendency towards a lower non-farm payrolls because we're not getting that tendency in claims as a secondary statistic. That data, 58 minutes away. The latest news, developing story in the last couple of weeks. More news, more headlines in the last hour on this, Lisa. Mask saying it's decided that all vessels due to transit the Red Sea will be diverted south around the Cape of Good Hope for the foreseeable future. Mass saying it's encouraging customers, quote, to prepare for complications in the area to persist and for there to be significant disruption 
to the global network. And this already we've seen uh, being priced through some of the shipping rates, which have increased significantly since December. At what point is this an idiosyncratic story for the shipping companies? And at what point is this a broader yeah. economic issue for costs going up with supply chains being somewhat disrupted? I have my stereotypes of this, and I am wrong, wrong, wrong. It's at the 35th latitude south where the Cape, uh, Cape Horn in South America is way, way down, way more treacherous, the Straits of Magellan, going around the Cape of Good Hope in modern day sailing. And John, it's not as treacherous as what we learned in school about shipwrecks years ago. Southwest South Africa, it's a much longer journey, much, much longer it's journey. It's a 2,500 miles Shanghai to New York City you add to the journey. You know, Nuts. Yeah. Crazy. Absolutely. Let's finish on this story. Demand for popular weight loss drugs like Azempic and Wegovi threatening to drain state and local government health care budgets. Medicaid reimbursement for the GLP-1 drugs has more than doubled over the last two years to $8 billion from three. List price for the drugs can rise above $1,000 a month. Drug makers Novo Nordisk, Eli Lilly, claiming this, Lisa, the drugs will pay for themselves, with obesity costing the U.S. healthcare system <clears throat> 173 billion US dollars every single year. I am so glad that we're talking about this story. There have been a whole host of different uh, Wigovi and Ozempic stories. This is a real question. Who bears the cost? When is this going to be covered by insurance? How do you calculate who actually benefits on the other side? Who's going to pay for dialysis? Who's already paying for all of these other things that are associated with obesity and uh, diabetes? So these are some of the questions as we try to parse out. Is this the same kind of macro trend as artificial intelligence, right? <clears throat> are we all becoming, are we all just living in an ozempic world where suddenly obesity is not going to be an issue? People are going to have to eat less. You're going to have a different kind of consumer experience at the likes of I'm McDonald's. I'm walking down Lexington Avenue and there's a little sign out like they're selling M&Ms or pizza or something. And it says, come on and get your Ozempic. <laughs> it does not say that. No, it did. Does. does it really? Yes, I've there not are. Seen that. Yeah, 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 little signs. Yeah, yeah, like the, the ones Come on like the down and get your. outside of Delhi. He's making it sound like you just walk past your local bodega. <laughs> it's bodega. a store for No, no John, Delhi. that's come what it looks down. like. <laughs> and I, I don't. It's you don't ask like a pharmacy or a doctor. Do the three of us decide that this is a free lunch? Really? Like. Like yeah. delis and not quite delis, but they're just sort of storefronts that have sort of un yeah. unclear in, kinds of signs over. that are just saying like come in. And they replace the old COVID testing places. Yeah. <laughs> old COVID and C B D distribution. It's good. Yeah, I mean, you it's know, the, many of those stores have been empty for a long time. So it's, <laughs> Sarah Wilson is fixing that. Yeah, exactly. Let's bring it back to the economy. Well, they did say it'll pay for themselves. Exactly. So, so that's is, maybe it. So you guys have been economy. talking about Zempic. I'm sitting over here with Sarah Wolf of Morgan Stanley. We've been deciding when you take your Christmas tree down. It's a huge debate here. I'm way, way behind. Pharaoh had the beast out on the street. What December 27th or so? Yeah, you, you know. No, I hate the tree. The tree graveyard I find really tree, depressing it's in very Manhattan. depressing. I find it's it very huge. upsetting. I really do. Right. But you know me. I've got a fake tree. And so, it came down on January 1st. Okay. Before the sun came up. Let's take a poll here. Help me out on Twitter and LinkedIn to see if I should take the tree down this weekend. I'm holding out for February. February, we'll have a better look at the jobs market. Sarah Wolf joins right now with Ellen Zentner, senior economist at Morgan Stanley. Let's just cut to the chase. What's your call today? Are you coming in below consensus, above consensus? What's your level of enthusiasm for the labor economy? We're more or less in line with consensus, 180,000. I think consensus is shaping up around 175. <coughs> more or less jobs are going to look quite a bit like they've been looking the last couple of months. We don't see that there's real material downside. One thing to take into consideration, construction, typically a big downside in December mm -hmm. because of weather. We've had a very warm, enjoyable December, so that could add some upside. We also got quite a bit of uh, layout, um, softening in retail trade in November, so we shouldn't right. see quite as much weakness <clears throat> going into December. Anna Wong, Dr. Wong over at Bloomberg is looking at the birth-death dynamics here of small business, mid-sized business as well. Is the unemployment report hiding or masking greater challenges in the American economy? Is the number actually going to be revised lower six months, a year from now? It's definitely possible. As you're going into a slowdown in activity, the birth death model, you know, it's a bit of a laggard indicator, so it's not really capturing in real time the death of businesses. I think we're probably getting a little bit more of that softness showing up in the ADP data, which has been pretty consistently running slightly below the non-farm payrolls data, and that does a better job of capturing small-sized businesses where more of the deaths have been concentrated. Headline, 
ADP matters. Headline, ADP <laughs> may matter more than non-farm non -farm payrolls. Is that what you're saying? ADP doesn't necessarily matter more than non-farm payrolls, but if we're trying to think about where the weakness is in hiring, we know that more of it is in, has been among small businesses, and ADP samples more of the small businesses in real time than, than non-farm payrolls, and so we could get some of that revision downside later on in the non-farm payrolls report. Given the fact that you do have all these varying measurements and such disparate kinds of economies that are moving at different paces, how valid is it to even look at the payrolls number to get a gauge of where the economy is? I mean, when you talk about Anna Wong, she was saying maybe we already had a recession, that we're actually in the recovery already. Do you buy into that kind of idea? We've definitely been in somewhat of a rolling recession, but we could all agree we have not been in a labor market recession. So maybe the housing market was in a bit of a recession. Durable goods expenditures have been in a bit of a recession. Equipment investment. But if you look at the labor market, I don't think we could, we're going to look back and say, oh, the labor market was in a recession in 2023. The labor market is still very strong. As you guys have all mentioned, jobless claims very low. The JOLTS data that we got earlier this week is showing openings are coming down, quits rates coming down, but layoffs have barely inched up. So yes, somewhat of a rolling recession, but the labor Labor market, which is really the key for are we in an overall economic recession, is still holding the front. So do you think that we could end up avoiding one entirely, that essentially this is what you get, and that especially because companies have been conditioned by the uh, pandemic, want to hoard labor, we're mm -hmm. seeing that because people are uh, getting jobs in industries that were so understaffed heading into the pandemic, do you think that we could just sort of stay here and not rise above 4.1 percent unemployment? Definitely. I think there's two things happening in the labor market. You still have a group of industries that have backfilling that still needs to happen. So if you think about health care and education, they still have quite a bit of hiring they need to do. And so that's going to add a bit of a cushion. If you look at health care alone, it's been adding 70 to 80,000 jobs a month to non-farm payrolls. Government as well still has quite a bit of hiring. It's been adding 30 to 40,000 payrolls. So you still have these catch-up industries that are going to give a nice cushion to payrolls in 2024. And then, as you mentioned, you have labor hoarding. So we dealt with a lot of scarring from not having enough work for three years. And so even industries think about retail trade, wholesale trade, construction, that maybe have right-sized their workforce are very hesitant to let go of their workers. And, mm -hmm. and from my seat, I talk to a lot of consumer corporate companies and all across, whether they're food services, retailers, they're still saying that they're very focused on worker retention and not looking towards layoffs next year. Wage growth today, there's month over month, year over year, someone previous said three-month annualized matters. What is your metric of the inflation component, the vector, if you will, of, of wage growth? Of course, the, the preferred metric is the employment cost index. It's a bit more steady. Agreed. But we Four get it percentage. at a lagged indicator. Yeah. We get it lagged, and we know that it's been coming off its peak for about a year. Still quite elevated, and I'd say yeah. still a little uncomfortably high. So is there value today in AHE given the importance of ECI? Now that we're not seeing as many dislocations in average hourly earnings because we were getting a lot of volatility in average hourly earnings due to where we were seeing layoffs and where we were seeing hiring back, I do think that average hourly earnings is still worth looking at as a pass through into the employment cost index. We're looking for 0.3% on the month, so that's a bit of a step down from last month, 0.4. The important thing is that that year over year pace is continuing to notch its way down each month. Your conclusion this week, Reggie Research, no cuts soon. No, no cut, cut soon. soon. When we look at the minutes on Wednesday, I mean, there was nothing that really indicated that they're getting ready to cut soon. Of course, they were going to talk about cutting at the December meeting because their summary of economic <coughs> projections showed 75 basis points in cuts. They had to acknowledge it. But it doesn't mean that they're getting ready to cut soon. I still think that there's a wide variety of views on when they should even start cutting. And if they're not in consensus about when to start cutting, March is going to be too soon. And the economic data is just not going to be there either. 180,000 on payrolls is not screaming a, a rate cut in March. You mentioned that variety of views. You see that in the dot plot, huge spread. Mm -hmm. Do you get a variety of views on client calls right now, or is it very one way? Just this market expecting cuts, cuts, cuts. It's interesting. So sitting on the consumer side, you know, largely, I talked to a lot of equity clients in, in addition to fixed income clients. I would say the equity guys are very bullish. <laughs> of course, Shocker. fixed income clients are a lot more bare. So when we think about market pricing for a March cut, I would say some of those fixed income clients are actually pricing in a recession starting this year, wow. whereas equity clients are a lot, have gotten really on board with the soft landing call, even though I would say a year ago it was hardest to convince them of our soft landing call. <laughs> you were early, that's for sure. It's great to catch up. Appreciate it. Happy New Year. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Sarah Wolf there of Morgan Stanley on this Payrolls Friday. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Stay to play. Equity futures negative by 0.2%. Yields higher by three or four basis points. Your 10-year 4.03% on a 10-year this morning, Lisa. Yields just a little bit higher. What a shocker. <laughs>
fixed income bearish. Isn't it always the way? Stock traders bullish. bullish. Yeah, but here's the weird thing. What if stock traders are actually ahead of the curve rather than bond traders, right? I mean, what if actually they're right and they've been right actually more often than some of the bond traders that have been shifting around yields like penny stocks? I mean, at a certain point, you have to wonder, okay, all right, who's actually it's right? It's just the nature of the asset class. It's an anticipatory asset class and your whole job is to sell dreams of a better future. Good stories, right? To sell stocks. That's always been the way, TK. It's no different now than it was years ago. I strongly agree with that. It's always been a big argument. I've had every single stock from the itty bittiest idiot Robin Hood GameStop thing up to Apple Computer. You're always selling a story of the future. This every a, time. This is probably the reason People why. People go, no, CFA this, CFA that. You know what? You're selling a story. Everybody needs an iPhone. That's this, it. This is why I gravitate <clears throat> toward fixed income. You know, do you get your money back? Because if I come up with a story, no, it's going to be true. existential and angsty and it's problematic, right. you know. How depressed should I be? And then you've got like the scale. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Like Very depressed. And fixed income. Uh, it might be okay. It's like that across Wall Street <laughs> and every fixed income desk. <laughs> 8.30 Eastern time for payrolls. We'll catch up with former Fed President Bill Dudley, former Fed Governor Randy Krosner, Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank, all still to come. Coming up next on the tension in the Middle East and what isn't <coughs> happening in the commodity market, Alan Wald of the Atlantic Council from New York. Good morning. I think we can't just sit by and see... Uh, shipping lanes in the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf and stay undefended. This is a tinderbox with the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf being crucial for oil. And I suspect things may get more tense before they get better. So th this will call for tough rhetoric at the very least. Things are getting more tense. That was Greg Vallier, AGF Investments Chief U.S. <coughs> Policy Strategist. The latest this morning from container shipping giant AP Moller Mask saying it's decided that all vessels due to transit the Red Sea will be diverted south around the Cape of Good Hope for the foreseeable future, the quote from that company earlier this morning, TK, just to repeat that for people just joining us, saying it's encouraging customers to, quote, prepare for complications in the area to persist and for there to be significant disruption to the global network. I wonder what government uh, officials will say about this. And, you know, the, the many, many different nations involved, and of course, particularly the United States. Did Merck's make this decision in consultation with the Pentagon, just as a, you know, kind of statement or that? I just... I, I really wonder how the, re the response will be from the government forces trying to protect all these ships in the Red Sea. My answer to your question is, I'm not sure it's unclear, I don't know. But I'll say this, Tom, based on what we do know, they've tried to prevent this from happening. Yes. And clearly failed. Yes. That, there's and no it may question. well take longer to address the issues. And we mentioned this earlier as, as well. You go back to uh, uh, the traditional wars of 1948, 1967 and on. There's nothing traditional here, as we heard earlier. We heard from Elliot Ackerman earlier. Uh, this week. I mean, it's absolutely original what we're living in uh, right now. We're going to get a briefing on this, and we're going to do this from the land of the hydrocarbon. Ellen Wald is definitive with her one volume on Saudi and on Saudi Arabia and the Saud family, and we're thrilled that she could join us uh, right now, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Ellen, just let me begin with a, a blunt instrument. Why hasn't the price of oil really moved? Well, that, that is a very good question, and I think the, the answer is mostly um, U.S. production is very, very high, has been very, very high, and uh, we're not seeing any kind of significant disruption in terms of um, supply getting to where it has to go because um, the you know the oil can be transported on these very large crude carriers which actually can't even go through the Suez Canal so I think we're we've definitely got disruption or potential disruption to to the oil trade but um, it's it's not as bad I think as right. um, people might have hoped however I do think that the potential for risk to oil supplies is growing uh, basically every day. If we can shut down the Red Sea, let's go, I believe it's east. Can we shut down the Arabian or Persian Gulf? Uh, I'm not sure that that would be quite as easy, but we can definitely threaten uh, threaten the safety of shipping in that area. And so uh, I do think that this is almost a, a case study or um, a, a, a very important inflection point to see what is the international community, which depends on safety in the waters. I mean, we're talking about global international shipping. We're not just talking about 
what goes through the Red Sea, what goes through the Suez Canal. But these actions that the Houthis are taking are having reverberations all around international shipping. I mean, rates are up 88 percent pre-pandemic. Uh, simply because of what we're seeing uh, in the Red Sea. So this isn't just uh, a local or isolated issue. This is having uh, large-scale reverberations. I saw your comments on this, Ellen, earlier this morning on Twitter or X, however you want to call it, where basically you were saying freedom of the seas is a global issue and that the Houthis' actions are going to have pretty broad-based uh, ramifications. Given that, Ellen, why aren't we seeing Saudi Arabia, Qatar, get on board with the United States to try to prevent these Houthi attacks? The, the short answer is it's complicated. And the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Houthis and the UAE and Houthis is very complicated and, and is much deeper. And I think we haven't heard a lot about it uh, unless you're really zooming in on the Middle East. I mean, the, the conflict between Saudi Arabia and UAE and the Houthis has been going on for a very long time. I mean, there were troops involved. Uh, UAE and, and Saudi were sending troops into Yemen for, for quite some time. There were missiles that the Houthis were shooting at Riyadh uh, and, and that were fine finding locations there. We had Riyadh uh, in using some of the, the um, missile systems from the U.S. To, to counteract these missiles. And then um, eventually they kind of reached a, uh, I don't know if you call it maybe a detente, where everything kind of cooled down. And I think that the Saudis and the Emiratis are really loath to re-engage in that conflict. Now, if the Houthis do threaten any kind of Saudi shipping or Emirati shipping in the area, then I think the, the pressure would be on them to get involved. And Saudi Saudi Arabia is particularly at risk because they have ports in the Red Sea between where the Houthis are and the Suez Canal. And those are, are, are pretty important uh, um, ports and pretty important areas for them. So if the Houthis are able to threaten those ports, uh, then I, I think that we would see them uh, get involved on the side of, of the United States. But I think until that happens, there are pretty strong uh, reasons keeping them out of this conflict. Given all of these complications, which are dizzying to think about when you zoom out how do you put this genie back in the bottle and if you can't doesn't that mean that even with u.s production hydrocarbon costs have to go up really materially if not only shipping is interrupted but also the shipping of those hydrocarbons yeah, exactly. And we're not just talking about hydrocarbons that go through the Suez. We're also talking about hydrocarbons that go through the Sumed pipeline, because unless they're coming from Saudi Arabia, they've got to go through that Red Sea point to even get to the Sumed pipeline. That is basically a, a workaround for the Suez Canal. So it's more than just uh, transit through the Suez Canal. Uh, I do think Europe is going to see the biggest um, uh, effects of this because they're getting a lot more of their oil from the Middle East right now, and um, they're going to be affected by much longer shipping times and higher rates as these ships uh, are going around uh, around Africa. And uh, I don't think we're, we're going to see shortages, but uh, there's definitely potential for higher costs. And um, if we see oil prices getting higher, then that will compound uh, these, these issues. Uh, I do think that the United States is going to have to make a decision whether this is purely a defensive operation or they're going to go on the offensive to some extent and actually uh, frighten the Houthis and, and show that there are real consequences. Ellen, you've been studying the Middle East for years and years. You wrote the book on Saudi Arabia. A lot of people look to you for your insight about the kingdom and about the region. And I'm just wondering, based on everything that you've seen over the past couple of weeks, how much have the chances of an escalation really increased from your vantage point? I do think that the chances are higher than we're seeing priced into the market right now. Uh, I think there are still very strong deterrences to seeing the conflict spread. Saudi Arabia does not want to get involved. It's not good for business to, you know, get started in a war in the Middle East. It's not good for, you know, the oil business to start any kind of conflict with Iran. But at the same time, we are seeing escalation that may not be able to be quelled unless uh, some offensive action is taken by uh, parties that aren't just Israel, particularly if Israel starts to escalate uh, the conflict into uh, into Lebanon, into something against Hezbollah, then um, we're likely to see just greater tension, greater uh, potential for terrorism across the Middle East. We already have seen things happening in Iraq and, uh, and in Iran. And so I do think that we're definitely at a higher higher risk of uh, conflict than we were even in October. With that in mind, just to put a bow on it, Ellen, how long would you expect these disruptions in the Red Sea to continue for? 
I would say they can continue for the foreseeable future unless uh, unless this coalition decides to go on the offensive. This is a very low cost, high return uh, event for the Houthis. And so unless their their supply of weapons is cut off or, or someone higher up in Iran tells them to, to cut it out, uh, I, I don't think that there's any real sign that they're going to stop. Amazing. Ellen, thank you. Appreciate the insight. Ellen, well there of the Atlantic Council on the situation in the Red Sea, really echoing what we heard from the container shipping giant AP Monomask a little bit earlier this morning. Looking ahead, TK, crude 78.20, WTI about 73. Ellen was saying it, not really priced in much risk there at all, have we? Well, have we yet? And Admiral Stravitas, writing for Bloomberg Opinion, was heated about this. You know, he didn't say, where's the offense? Let's go get them. There are many people saying that. But he said, what's the plan to shift from a hugely defensive characteristic in the Red Sea. Maybe we'll, now with this Maersk announcement, maybe we'll hear something into the weekend news cycle. Crude positive by almost 1%, <clears throat> higher by about three quarters of 1% this morning. Coming up very shortly, we're going to break things down with Nadia Lovell of UBS, looking ahead to the year ahead in the equity market and counting you down to payrolls. The report at 8.30 Eastern time. Fantastic lineup for you. Randy Krosner of the University of Chicago, TK. Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank. Bill Dudley, former New York Fed president. I believe we'll catch up with Gina martin Adams as well. So that's your lineup, Tom, for the next 60 minutes or so. It takes economics of the moment, all that we'll give you. And Mike McKee will give you at 8.30. And John, it folds it right into what's it mean for a market beleaguered. The payrolls report are coming up very shortly. The estimate 175,000 in the Bloomberg survey. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. jolts data, the quits rate, openings to unemployment, all of this signals that there's a great normalization happening. We are expecting a slowdown, to be fair. We think that we'll see a softer monthly growth. We're looking for job growth to be settling here somewhere in the 150, 175 a thousand a month range. This idea that kind of we're going to grind higher in unemployment, that's something that I think we have to watch out for. Business, the consumer and the jobs market will play an important role this year. He works word to watch for is resilience. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen. It's Jobs Day. We'll see that here in 29 minutes. An interesting jobs report. And John Farrow, to me, what everything is about here is everybody's sort of things. It's another normal December report. All my radar, radar's up in 29 minutes. A new number returns to the screen. The number is four on a 10-year yield. It's 4.04%. It yields are higher again today, higher again yesterday, Tom, off the back of better-than-expected data. ADP came in stronger. Jobless claims came in lower. That's the right kind of downside surprise. Will we get more of the same on payrolls in about 29 minutes? And to correlate that over to this interesting discussion with Priya Misra, the real yield back up to 1.81%. There's been a real reversal in the joy of December, and you what, you wonder, John, what aspect of the jobs report will move the reversal forward, a stronger, a worse equity market, I should say, or will it reverse it to the nirvana that we saw, say, December 15th? Let's start with the headline number. So let's say 175, that's the estimate. 175 sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Unemployment below 4%, yes. if it stays yes. there, great. Jobless claims close to 200K, fantastic. But when you ask economists, Carl Riccadonna, BNP Paribas, on this program <coughs> in the last day some, talking about beneath the surface, yeah. breadth. He's going to look at diffusion. How strong is the payrolls growth? How broad is that growth? Just a select few industries, or are we seeing it across the economy? And at the moment, there's a concern that you're seeing it in just a select few industries over the last six months. And Lisa, what's important here is in diffusion is the signals given by the market, and one of them is a spread market where spreads have widened out. Does that indicate a tension on the real economy? Well, it's the same story as you're seeing in the stock market. And as you guys were talking, I was thinking that there are two things that we're going to learn from today's labor market report. One is the granular economics that John was referring to under the hood, what we see in terms of the composition. The other is, where is the market over its skis? How is the market going to respond if we do get a one, two, and then three punch with better than expected labor market data with the non-farm payrolls capping it off? Do you see right. an escalation of the sell-off that we've already seen 
rising this week, both in bonds and stocks. And that goes to say a 200,000 statistic or 220,000 statistic. Not many people are looking for that. To Lisa's point, we've just turned last year upside down. So the end of last year, stocks were rallying, credit spreads were tighter, the dollar was weaker, yields were lower. What's <laughs> happening now? Equities selling off, credit spreads are wider, the dollar is stronger, Tom, and yields are higher. We're we just squeezing out a big position that was building up in a space of just two yeah. months. You think about where the 10-year Treasury yield was, 60 basis point move lower <clears throat> in November, 40 basis point move lower in December. We're talking 100 basis points, TK, coming into 2024. And a market just <laughs> sort of locked onto this idea that rate cuts are just around the corner. I mean, Nadia is going to come up here from UBS with a 51 SPX in the Uber Bowl. Ed Yardeni said in his, week, his overnight note, which, folks, I really recommend you look at, Ed Yardeni's uh, hugely accessible note, and the answer is Lee is he says it's a roller coaster get over it this is what yeah this is the normal market is to have a roller coaster yeah, it's a roller coaster that ends at what six thousand i mean this is ed yardeni who thinks that we're in the roaring 20s it is a roller coaster and yet what i think is interesting is that people are leaning into the roller coaster right now rather than a long-term bet because of the economic data being as mysterious as it has been jan i'm going to go to uh, west texas intermediate 73 dollars a barrel just off that ellen wald conversation that was valuable crude picking up just a little bit brent crude up by point nine percent the broader price action the scores look like this going into payrolls equity futures negative by 0.3 percent on the S&P four day losing streak on the S&P 500 and about to snap as things stand about to snap a nine week winning streak on the S&P 500 the longest weekly winning streak Tom going back to 2004 yeah. for the S&P. Michael McKee scheduled to be with us here in 25 minutes. Randall Krosner, Blue School of Chicago, the former Fed governor. Bill Dudley scheduled to be with us today, the former New York Fed president. We turn now to the equity markets. Nadia Lovell, senior U.S. equity strategist at UBS 5100 Global Wealth Management, joins us this morning. Nadia, I'm going to go right into your research note within the compendium of our economics. You say earnings are, quote, skewed to the upside. Where does that enthusiasm come from? You know, it's a momentum that we're seeing in the economy. I mean, since we produced our year ahead outlook in late October, for clarification, the S&P is trending more towards our upside scenario of 5,100. And that's because the macro data has been coming in better than expected with inflation coming down faster than expected. And if the Atlanta Fed GDP now forecast is correct in that sort of two and two and a half percent yeah. range for GDP and that continues into 2024, you could see some upside to earnings from there. The upside here off a Q3 five number or four number, I should say high four, or that Atlanta GDP number, is that because of the American consumer? And does that American consumer enthusiasm fold into this morning's jobs report? Oh, we think so. We think that the consumer remains in solid shape. Yes, you're seeing some areas of consumer stretch, but, you know, spending during the holiday season was pretty strong. Um, and that should continue into 2024. Of course, it will be at a slower pace, but there aren't any signs that the broader consumer isn't holding in there. And inflation is coming down. You're seeing wage growth. So well, income is picking up and that should be a positive. So Nadia, some of the leading sectors going into year end tech was one discretionary another. Is that where you're looking for leadership in 2024 as well? We don't necessarily think that you're going to see a massive outperformance um, from tech like you did last year, but we do think that tech will continue to outperform. Now, let's put this into context. Like, yes, a great year in 2023, but pull back the charts, John, and tech is only up 5% over the last two years and the Magnificent Seven only up 10%. So when you think about that also from a valuation standpoint, tech is trading at a 10% discount to where it was a year ago. So fundamentally, we think that the fundamentals have improved and tech can continue to outperform. But we do think that performance will broaden out this year to some of the more cyclical areas of the market, particularly if we can see that the Fed can land this economy into a soft landing and economic growth holds in there. That should help cyclical areas um, and also help small cap. That introduces the energy conversation. I'm going to reference your note directly, Nadia. For Ferro, <laughs> we're less bullish on oil. <laughs> and Nadia, talk to me about it. What's changed? Well, yes, I mean, Brent Oil did reach our $95 target in September. We thought it would hold. Clearly, that's not the case. Um, you know, of course, yes, demand did surprise to the upside. We saw a strong trend from China and India. But unfortunately, so did supply, particularly from those non OEC, uh, um, uh, OPEC plus um, countries like the U.S. And so when we look into 
2024, we do think that you'll still get demand growth, just less slow. And uh, we do think that OPA Plus will continue to try to manage supply. But we are not seeing such a massive deficit in the oil market in 2024, just a slight deficit. That will be enough to push prices um, back towards $85, so down from the $95 that we had thought previously. Um, and so we think that they will provide a better off-ramp. And as you've been talking about all morning, I mean, yes, heightened geopolitical tension in the Middle East is not part of our base case, and that could provide some upside to oil prices. What do you make of the fact that we were just hearing about how equity analysts are really leaning into this whole soft landing attitude, and you've got the bond analysts who are talking about recession and are much more pessimistic. How do you sort of navigate that at a time where it does seem like soft landing is the base case for pretty much everyone in the equity world right now? You know, it's not unusual for equity investors to be more optimistic than than, than bond investors. Um, but when you look at the data, I mean, the data is speaking towards a soft landing. I mean, we'll see where payrolls is coming in, um, you know, in a few minutes. But, you know, all indications is that the job market is holding, holding up well. And so there isn't a really any reasons today to be overly uh, pepped pessimistic. And so we do think that, uh, you know, sort of uh, one to one and a half cents GDP growth for this year and sort of reconcile that with inflation coming down faster than the Fed's target. I mean, our expectations is that you are going to see raise cuts this year, not as much as the market is pricing. And we're looking for three with the bias to uh, four rate cuts out for, for this year. And that will help to bring down bond yields and further uh, support the equity market. I'm going to make Stuart Kaiser fall off his chair and Tom Keene's going to roll his eyes. But at what point is good news, bad news? And I ask this because basically you're talking about how, you know, you want to see economic data that's good and that that's going to support your bullish thesis. And yet, if you look at the bond world, which is more pessimistic, they're saying all of this good news means the Fed can't cut rates as much as people think. You know, I think that, you know, at some point that you will start to shift to, you know, good news being good news and bad news just being bad news. Uh, where that tipping point is still remains to be seen. You know, a lot of this is contingent on the labor market. But, you know, whether the Fed cuts with um, March or May probably is not that much of a big deal. Is It's 25 basis points difference. It's that the Fed that is going to cut this year. I think that's what's important and that those cuts are likely to happen um, by around mid-year, particularly if inflation continues to decline. We all know core PC six months annualized is at 1.9 percent. And so we'll be watching that very closely. If you can get uh, a couple more months of below 20 basis points uh, month over month increase, and that could pull forward the rate cuts at the end of the day. Nadia, it is always great to hear from you. Thanks for catching up. Nadia Lover there of UBS Global Wealth Management. Happy New Year. Good to hear from Nadia going into payrolls. That data about 19 minutes away. Lisa mentioned Stuart Kaiser of City. I've got the quote from his research in front of me, so I'll read it to you <laughs> on the data that we're expecting and how he thinks the market responds to it. Consensus expects payrolls at about 170K. The unemployment rate to rise to 3.8%. Average hourly earnings to grow something like 0.3% month on month. Stuart says this, we see that mix of data as positive for equity markets as it continues a trend of strong labour markets, Tom, with modest loosening and wage inflation on a downtrade. Now, that's one opinion, right. and that's Stuart's <clears throat> opinion, going into payrolls in about 20 minutes. And the unspoken here to my first question to Nadia is, what does earnings growth do? And I got too many people I respect, including Nadia Lovell, uh, saying they just have it wrong, the gloom, the bad news, good news, bad news thing is wrong. Earnings growth is going to surprise optimistically. That's not what's happened this week, though. Just want to point out that the good news has been bad news this week. So maybe people will say eventually good news is good news. I, I can't even keep saying this. Whatever. You can. My no, point carry is, on, please. It makes perfect <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> it's just I realize I sound ridiculous, but it, people are selling off in response to better than expected economic data. Uh, yields have been pushing higher off the back of some of this. If you are just joining us, here's the price action, starting with the bond market. Yields up on a 10 year, back through 4%, 4.05, higher by five basis points. The SP lower by 0.3%. To Lisa's point, Tom, that's been a story of the week so far, just in the last 24 hours anyway. Better data than expected, pushing yields <clears> up. Well, I like you know, what somebody said, we're January 5, so we're 370 days into 2023. I mean, it's just a continuation on, and at some point the year's going to start, and maybe the year starts in 13 minutes. I think last year was a decade and a year. I think we can all agree on that, like right? That. Yes, like early a on in a, it's a decade worth of price action in 12 months, didn't we? <clears throat> it's yeah. not like, you know, a year and a, and a week. So that's the reason we push this forward, right? We'll have a millennium by the end of 2024. Randy Krosner joining us shortly, former Fed governor. 
Governor to break down his thoughts on this Federal Reserve, what he's looking for <coughs> from the FOMC this year, and what he's anticipating to see in the payrolls report as well. The payrolls report about 17 minutes away, and the state of play in financial markets, a little something like this. Equities up, yields higher. It's been the story of the week so far. Yields climbing by something like 15, 16, 17 basis points on a 10-year and an equity market on quite a losing streak. Four days on the S&P, five days on the Nasdaq. A nine-week winning streak. Guys, we're talking about the longest winning, weekly winning streak going back to 2004. Tom, that's how good things have been. And I keep saying this. Well, the weakness we've seen this week and some of the stats speaks to how good things have been over the last two months. Yeah, and you know, you wonder, are we on our way to a correction? And I would suggest corrections are a normal part of the market. You don't have to get all enthused by your Denny's roller coaster. That's what it's supposed to be. It's Randy Krosner, up. up next, a little bit later, Bill Dudley, <clears throat> former New York Fed president. Tons still to come. Your payrolls report, 8.30 Eastern time. From New York, this is Bloomberg. We look at the, the hiring trend, it's been a very linear trend since the start of last year. Now, there is a slope to that line and it's aiming lower. So there is a, a hissing sound in the labor market. If we're looking at non-farm payrolls averaging in the vicinity of 150 to 200,000, uh, that's still a very healthy income and wage dynamic for the economy. The brilliant Carl Riccadonna, good friend as well, chief US economist over yes, at BNP Paribas, so. referring to the hissing sound, just some of the air coming out of the labor market, just a little bit. From New York City, your payrolls report is just around the corner. 8.30 Eastern time, 14 minutes away. You know the numbers by now, the estimate 175,000 in our survey, and the scores look like this coming into it. Equity softer on the S&P, yields a little bit higher by four basis points on a 10-year <coughs> to 4.04%. Equity <coughs> futures, Tom, negative here by 0.2%. Let's remember, Alexander Tanzi in Washington is our best data guy. I steal from him every day, every week of the year. He does magnificent work, John. He sends in the standard error of the non-farm payables report. It used to be a quiescent 100,000, plus or minus 100,000. And he says with all the new regime and the pandemic and all, we're out near 130,000. So you can be 130,000 off on your job guest today and say, well, that's just part of the statistical error. The spread between the high and low is about 155,000. Yeah. So the high estimate today is 235, Tom. The low <clears throat> is 80K. Someone who knows the math, one over the square root of N, is Randall Krosner. He holds court at the Booth School in Chicago, the former Fed governor, understands the standard error. Randy, I'm going to go to where I was with Dr. Wong of Chicago earlier, the great Anna Wong, where she said, you know what, it's messy out there and particularly the birth-death mystery of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Do we have a clue how we count the labor economy? Are we making it up as we go post-pandemic? Well, I wouldn't go so far as we're making it up as we go, but obviously there have been some changes, some fundamental changes in um, the way people participate in the labor force, uh, the way people work from home. And so uh, obviously things are a little bit more difficult to uh, to track than they were before. But I think we have a reasonable bead on things. But as you said, um, you just said, standard deviations are up a little bit. So um, sure, it's up, but I still think there's information content in it. The information content is about half of America going, what does Krosner know, what does Keen know, Farrell, Abramowitz, and the rest, and that half of America's flat on their back. You see it in some used car price deflation. You see it in rising bankruptcies as well. Can we aggregate our economy off today's data, or are there two, three, or four Americas? Well, I think there are multiple Americas, but what the Fed has to do is look at the economy overall. Obviously, uh, its uh, policies can have more or less impact on different groups. Um, one of the groups that it has the biggest impact on is potential homeowners. Uh, but it does have to try to put all the pieces together to make um, national policy. Not always perfect, but uh, but it's what they need to do. Are we creating the right kind of jobs, Randy? Uh, uh, so uh, I think we're creating good jobs. The challenge, I think, is making sure that people have the skills for those jobs. Um, that's one of the challenges that's, that we've seen over the last few years of this mismatch between what people, uh, what uh, 
uh, what firms want and what people have. And so making sure that we're investing in education, making sure that we're investing in the right skill set for people is crucial, not only for the job market for today, but also for economic growth over the longer run. I ask this because a lot of people are talking about the composition of jobs that we're expecting to see today, whether it's the government officials who are going to necessarily play significantly into this, healthcare workers. I think about some of the service sector side that have been doing a lot of the hiring. Is this the kind of hiring that can sustain the kind of growth that we've seen in the U.S. economy over the past 12 months? Uh, I think... Um, as we've seen since the uh, the pandemic, we've seen kind of waves of going in different directions. Everybody wanted goods, then everyone then everyone wanted services. Obviously, healthcare is, uh, is starting to grow, and um, and so uh, and then tech is very important. Many of the tech firms cut back on on workers, but uh, there are a lot of tech startups, a lot of new areas that are coming in. So I think that's that's an area that we'll need to be um, very mindful of going forward. What are you watching most closely? I know that you mentioned in some of your notes wages, and I've been looking at wages also. This idea that 3.9% growth in wages is not commensurate with a 2% inflation rate for the Federal Reserve. What do you see when you look under the dynamics of pay? Yeah, I think that's really the key, because I think that's one of the key things that the Fed is going to be focusing on, not just the uh, the robustness of the labor market, but what does the robustness of the labor market mean for inflation? And that really is going to be filtered through wages. If wage growth is still very strong, that's really the key cost for most firms, whether certainly if they're services firms, but even for manufacturing firms. And so if wages are growing at 4 or 5%, um, to get inflation down to 2%, the only way to do that sustainably is have a big boom in productivity growth of 2 to 3%. We're, we've seen some pretty good productivity growth recently. I don't know if that's going to be sustained. But that's really the key thing to focus on is looking at, uh, or at least I think, uh, looking at wages and productivity growth. Randy, before we get stuck and drowning in the numbers that we get in about eight minutes' time, what are your thoughts on the communication from the Fed we've had over the last month or so? It felt like the chairman was pivoting towards a conversation about rate cuts in the near future. Minutes kind of said something else. New York Fed President John Williams certainly said something else. What was your take on it all? Yeah, I think um, I think Jay may have gotten a little um, uh, ahead of his, uh, a little over his skis or whatever the uh, the metaphor is uh, on getting people excited about um, uh, rate cuts coming too soon because I don't think that's where the consensus is and I don't think that's exactly where where Jay wanted it uh, Jay wanted it to be. I think as you said, there's a lot of pushback from uh, a number of the uh, of the Fed speakers that well, hold on a second, you know, we're, this doesn't mean that we're starting to cut in March or um, uh, but we are on a path over the year to cut, and I think that's right, and I think he had exactly the right message there. Uh, but I think markets got a little bit too excited, and I think the uh, the minutes helped to clarify that. A lot of people feel the same way. Randy, stay close. You're going to stick with us, I'm pleased to say. He's going to respond to the payrolls report in about seven minutes' time. Mike McKee is <coughs> going to break that down for you. Mike McKee is alongside us in a radio studio. Mike, talk to us about it. What are you looking for in seven minutes? Well, right now, the forecast is for 175, which is a reasonable number given the inputs that we've had from other data sources. Uh, the, anything between 150 and 200,000 would be considered a strong number. Go below 150, that's when I think you might get a market reaction to the idea of uh, when the Fed will be cutting rates. Uh, you get down to 100,000 and the Fed would not be concerned, but the markets would probably panic in that case. 3.8%. Um, that's just a tick up for the unemployment rate. Uh, the interesting question that has been in the markets for a while is when do we trigger the SOM rule? It isn't going to be today. You'd have to go up to 4.4 percent in oh, today, interesting. which would have yeah. its own implications in order for the SOM rule to be triggered and uh, recession be forecast by unemployment. Mike McKee, what's the greatest aberration of December? I mean, you know, the tradition is it's retail shopping, but come on, Amazon blew all that up. What's the countability? oddity of December. We don't have the same oddities as we used to, Tom, because a lot of the temporary hiring that takes place for the holiday season has moved earlier into October and November. Uh, there has been a shortage of workers anyway, so we may not see the kind of give back that uh, otherwise we would. January has traditionally been the month where you would see the layoffs of all the holiday workers, and that's not been happening. The question is, do we see any changes in any uh, significant other 
categories, did restaurants put on more people because people were going out to uh, celebrate the holiday season, that kind of thing. But we, we don't really have an oddity anymore in uh, the, the holiday numbers once they're seasonally adjusted. Mike McKee is going to be with us in about five minutes' time. Mike, stay close. Mike McKee standing by. Bramo 175 is the headline estimate here. Unemployment, as Mike suggested, 3.8%. That's the estimate, 37 previously. Then you've got the wage growth, 0.3%, and a ton of underindicators as well. What are you looking for? What I'm watching is wages, and I'm watching the revisions. I think that really, if you see wages tick up more than expected, that's going to really be the cap to what already has been a good news is bad news type of week. As far as the headline number, I feel like every month we sort of get this sort of uh, response, the knee-jerk response to the headline number, and then you sort of take a look beneath the surface, and those are the indicators that really drive action. You know, in the weekly claims, I look at a four-week moving average, which is a Bloomberg function. That's the one that I've memorized, INJCJC4. And here I'm going to look at the three-month average, uh, Lisa, to your point on revisions. You take the immediate revisions. We'll do that math for you. But then I want to look back at three-month non-farm payrolls. What are you doing in the last 90 days? What a fantastic lineup through the next 30 minutes. We'll break things down with Randy Krosner, the former Fed governor, and the former New York Fed president, Bill Dudley, just around the corner as well. All of that still to come. Your payrolls report up next. The scores look like this going into the data. Equity futures negative down by 0.2% and the S&P 500 on a four-day losing streak. The data up next. Your payrolls report about 20 seconds away. The scores going into it in financial markets. The S&P looks like this. <clears throat> Equity futures on the S&P slightly negative by 0.2% on the Nasdaq down by 0.2. Negative a quarter of 1% on a five-day losing streak, potentially making it day six. In the bond market, going into that jobs report, yields higher on a 10-year by three basis points, a little more than 4% on the 10-year. With your jobs report, here's Mike McKee. Well, we got a strong one, guys. 216,000 jobs were created in the month of December, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the unemployment rate stays unchanged at 3.7%. So uh, strength in the labor market. Uh, average hourly earnings were up four-tenths. The forecast was for three-tenths. And so average hourly earnings on a year-over-year -year basis go up to 4.1% from 4%, certainly higher than the 39 that had been forecast. So we definitely get a uh, surprise in the numbers here. The two-month net revision, however, is negative 71. Uh, so we are seeing a, uh, a decline in the number of jobs that were reported in October and November. For December, or the, for November rather, the number was 173. Remember, it originally reported as 199. Change in private payrolls, very strong. This is interesting because a lot of people have been talking about <coughs> government hiring driving this. 164,000 of those 216 are on private payrolls. That's up from 136,000 the month before and well over the 130 that had been expected. Manufacturing payrolls come in up 6,000, just 1,000 more than forecast. That's down from 26,000 uh, the month of November. Labor force participation rate falls to 62.5 and average uh, hours work uh, falls to uh, no, yeah it falls to 34.3 so a uh, very strong report uh, considering the circumstances and I'm sure uh, well I'm gonna bet there's a market reaction <laughs> yeah Mike I think you can guess in which direction Mike McKee thank you rate cuts what rate cuts following this one let's get to it equities down yields up dollar stronger equity futures on the S&P 500 and their session lows are negative 0.5 percent yields are higher across the board up 10 basis points at the front end on a two-year 448 on a 10-year up by nine basis points, very close to 4.1% on a 30-year. Further out along the curve, up seven basis points, 4.22.30. <coughs> Yields up, Tom, dollar stronger, the euro negative, and taking out 109 yeah. and dropping to 108. On 108, 84 on euro dollar, negative yeah. by 0.6%. And on a global base, you should see it in the yen dynamic, tangential to the labor economy report, but a solid nine-tenths of a percent yen weaker move uh, right now. John, what I see here is Anna Wong is brilliant, 216 
2018, take out the 71 revisions, you got 145,000 is a summed statistic with the revisions for this non-farm payrolls. And then the other thing clearly is the wage inflation is, is there. Headline number 216,000 against an estimate of 175. <clears throat> Wages hotter than expected. The unemployment rate stays at 3.7%. Mike McKee, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Before these numbers drop, we talked about breadth. How broad-based were these job gains? What do you see beneath the surface? Basically, it looks like it's reasonably broad-based. We had healthcare adding 38,000 jobs. Of course, that's the category that is always in need of workers. Uh, social assistance up by 21,000 as part of that. Construction employment up 17,000. That had been a, a weak point in recent months. Uh, builders looking for workers because there's such demand for housing these days. Transportation and warehousing dropped by 23,000. That's interesting because couriers and messengers were down by 32,000. And this is the if you drove around New York in December, you couldn't get up and down the street because there's a delivery truck parked everywhere. Uh, so it's interesting that there were fewer jobs this time. Leisure and hospitality, as always, adding uh, jobs, 40,000 jobs, uh, an average of 39,000 for the whole month, uh, uh, the whole year of uh, 2023. And retail employment was up by about 17. So we're basically looking at a fairly broad dispersion of the number of jobs created. Oh, I should mention I was wrong. Government employment was the biggest change, up 52,000, most of that in state and local, not federal. But uh, we did see a very strong month in December. I think Tom's point is good, though. Um, the revision, you take the revisions out, you have a weaker overall number, and we'll have to see if the December number gets revised down when we get to uh, February. Early days. Mike McKee, thank you. We'll see if this move sticks, but ultimately, Elisa taking a bite out of rate cut bets for March. That's for sure off the back of this one. I'm just still focused on the wage increase that we saw. The 4.1% year over year is exactly in the wrong direction. What's interesting to me is that there are signs of weakness in an odd way. Participation rate went down 62.5 <coughs> from 62.8, and the, uh, the underemployment rate actually ticked up. So not necessarily consistent, it's still early days, but consistent with this incredible efficiency. Everybody's coming back to the market, kumbaya, immaculate sure. disinflation. The initial reaction, stocks down, yields up, dollar stronger. Let's get some reaction from Randy Kreisner, former Fed governor, now professor of economics at the University of Chicago. Let's talk about it, Randy. Your first reaction to this one. So as we were saying before, I think the Fed focuses a lot on uh, wage growth and we've seen uh, wage growth above expectations. I think it's really clear that the Fed is going to be waiting um, a while before it starts cutting rates uh, because uh, the labor market is still quite strong, the uh, wage growth is still quite strong, and um, wages are the key thing that then feed into services as well as uh, manufacturing inflation. Randy, not the simple arithmetic of a real wage, but almost just a cultural and societal note. Do you see here wage growth being beneficial across America and that people will have more inflation adjusted cash in their pockets? Oh, it's super great to have real wage growth, finally. I mean, we had, uh, even though nominal wages were growing very rapidly, they weren't growing as fast as inflation. And so people were uh, were feeling left behind. And they were and they were left behind because they wanted to put food on the table for their, uh, their families, and the food was a heck of a lot more expensive than it was before. Now they're, uh, they're starting to earn a bit more than, uh, than inflation, which is great for them. But I think what that's going to mean over time is that, well, when it was great to be hiring people when uh, labor was relatively cheap in real terms, now I think you're going to start to see um, uh, a little bit of softening of the labor market because it's just not going to be as, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, worthwhile for, for firms to be hiring when workers are more, were relatively more expensive. Randy, why is it that we've seen so many downward revisions of the prior months? Does that mean that we can expect a significant downward revision of this upside surprise come uh, the data that we get in February? Uh, well, this gets back to what uh, Tom was talking about before. The standard deviation has gotten wider. Uh, so there's a lot more noise that's in there. I don't think you can take something specific out that it's always going to be downwardly revised. I think we just know that there are going to be some uh, substantial revisions.
Hey, Randy, appreciate the update. Some revisions to some forecasts as well for rate cuts, maybe, after this one. For anyone pencilling in March, I think there's a rethink following that, especially if we get another one of these for this month, next month, too. If you are just joining us, hot jobs report, 216,000, the estimate 175. Unemployment, the estimate, we were looking for that to climb from 3.7 to 3.8. It stayed at 3.7. Takes a while to read through all of this. Mike McKee's alongside us breaking it down. Mike McKee, what do you see in the labor market report on the second, third, fourth look? Well, if you're going to look for some bad news, John, you might look at unemployment. Unemployment was unchanged at 3.7 percent, but that's because there was a big drop in the civilian labor force falls by 676,000 and hiring dropped in the household survey by 683,000. Only 6,000, though, were unemployed. So uh, it looks like a kind of an odd balancing of the household survey uh, inputs to unemployment that suggests maybe it's not as strong, at least on the employment side, as uh, the overall numbers show. And the other thing people were looking at was the revisions to the unemployment rate last year. There were some expectations that it could move the needle on something like the SOM report if we got higher unemployment rates last year it's all, they're, that are always revised in December and it comes out the only month that was revised was October, down a tenth of a percent, and uh, the rest of the year was completely unchanged. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. We'll get a final word with Mike before the end of the program, before the end of this hour. Equity futures on the S&P going into the opening bell at 9.30 Eastern time, lower near session lows, down by 0.5 percent. The Nasdaq 100 off by 0.5 as well. The Russell, the small caps, getting absolutely hammered. We're down 1.4 percent there. Yields are higher by eight basis points, 4.08 percent. And in Alan Ruskin's world, World, the dollar is stronger, the euro is weaker. We've broken 109, 108, 96. Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank joins us now. Alan, good morning. Happy New Year. Morning. Let's get straight into it. What do you think of that one? Yeah, well, uh, it's certainly uh, good news as far as uh, growth is concerned. A little bit more worrying as far as you know, the underlying inflation picture, with wage inflation in particular. Um, I think one thing the market should take into consideration is that the state of the economy in December was reflecting tightening financial conditions from months earlier, probably more reflective of a bond market uh, at, uh, say, 10-year to 5% yield than a 4% yield. So there's a lot of stimulation that's still going to come through that's going to be supportive for the employment uh, reports coming forward in uh, Q1 and Q2. We're misguessing GDP. Third quarter was a shock, five, maybe now revised down to 4.x percent. We're hearing that fourth quarter may be the same or diminished, but still the same. Are, are we just misguessing the strength of the American economy off this jobs report? Is it just simply better than we expect? I think it's been simply better than we've expected for more than a year. I mean, you just look at the employment report misses. There are very, very few downside misses in terms of uh, the forecasting. So there's a pattern here of uh, underestimating the strength of the U.S. economy. I don't think that this is uh, that different, really. Uh, the mm -hmm. now cast Q4 GDP numbers are, you know, close to 2.5%. Uh, certainly when we're looking at the data, we're anticipating that uh, if there's going to be genuine weakness, it's got to start showing up in the first half of uh, this year. And that's the highest probability right. in terms of negative growth. Are we misjudging too weak a dollar? That seems to be the zeitgeist now. I know you're pushing against that. but Yeah, yeah no, I think that's, uh, that's certainly true in terms of the short term. I think what we're seeing for 2024 so far is this pushback in terms of uh, uh, rate uh, cuts for the first half of the year, second half of the year as well, and the dollar is just a reflection of that. And we're seeing some pretty big moves now. I think the biggest question mark is really over dollar yen. A lot of people have anticipated that you know, this is the year uh, of the yen. It's, I don't think, going to be the year of the yen, at least in the first half of the year. Well, we can talk more about Bank of Japan policy another time. I am curious, though, uh, with respect to rate cuts, you were forecasting quite a few in the back half of the year, not necessarily starting in March. If this continues, you said we have to see weakness in the first half of the year. When do you revise your call? And maybe don't call for as many rate cuts and actually get incredibly bullish on the dollar versus the euro and a whole host of other currencies. Yeah, so I mean, this be a sort of something that uh, you know my colleagues, uh, Matt Lizetti in particular, would uh, um, revise uh, in terms of uh, any sort of reconsideration. Um, I think if you had the first quarter 
generally put up some solid numbers, these kinds of numbers, you'd really have to question whether the economy is slowing down materially at all. And I think the Fed's bias has still been, if in the very short term they could store hike rates, uh, that could still come back on the table. I think, uh, you know, that's leaping ahead a long way, but uh, um, certainly taking back rate cuts is a relatively easy call as per what John said in terms of March, I think looks, you know, um, that two-thirds probability of a rate cut that we had effectively before this data looks uh, exaggerated to I say mean, you mentioned least. some of the big moves we're seeing. I just wonder whether we're learning more about market positioning than we are the US economy. Which one is it? I think a lot of what we saw in November and December looked like a real squeeze of positioning and an exaggerated move in relatively thin markets. And people obviously wanted to judge and jump on a what is seen as a sea change, you know, move from uh, rates no longer going up. And I think that made sense, but then the market just uh, got ahead of itself and now we, we're in retreat. Can I ask you, and particularly off the back of data like this, I think it's worth asking, I have no idea where we're going here, absolutely no idea. But I think the overwhelming consensus is not just cuts. Even the people who don't think you get cuts anytime soon, they think this Fed is absolutely done. Is there a chance they need to hike interest rates again based on information like this? I would say that if you were flatlining consistently and you still had wage inflation running at these kinds of levels, then the Fed would have to think in terms of whether they could get inflation all the way down to 2% in a reasonable time frame. But I think we're quite a long way away from that sort of reconsideration of rate hikes, but uh, it's not totally without, you know, out of the realms of possibility. Well, what John said there, I want to pick up on this idea that are we learning more about market positioning than the economy, especially at a time where every month the previous month's data gets revised so significantly, and you have seen that sort of gap increase over time. Does that make you less confident in these numbers? Do you sort of not look at these numbers as much as you do the three-month rolling average that looks perhaps less rosy than this one? Uh, yeah, I think you've got to take a very holistic view of uh, all the data as such. So it's you know not, obviously not just the employment report, although I would still say it's the number one release. Um, Absolutely. Look at the two-month, three-month, four-month uh, moving averages. Look at things like the diffusion index, which has shown that the breadth of uh, employment growth is narrowed over time. I would still say the labor market is slowing. Uh, that uh, all the underlying dynamics that we've seen in things like the quit rate, for example, the openings data to some degree as well, does suggest that uh, the breadth of employment is weakening. Just real quick here, do you think that the accommodation that we saw in the market that actually effectively gave a rate cut to the market over the past couple of months, do you think that that turbocharged the economy on the margins? I think it's going to turbocharge the economy. I and I, I would say it's much more than one rate cut. Um, you know, if you have a 100 basis point uh, reduction in the 10-year yield, that's going to equate to 150 basis points at the outside 200 basis points of Fed, re Fed funds rate cuts. So there's a lot of potential stimulus that's going to kick in and obviously spilt over to other financial conditions as well. So the equity market is going to keep that uh, wealth effect on the consumer side uh, buzzing as well. So there's, there's, there's a lot of stimulus there. What a start to 2024. Anna, thank you. Thank really you. Really good to see you. Anna Ruskin there of Deutsche Bank. Let's turn to the price action, shall we? And the economic data, the number 216,000, the estimate 175. Unemployment came in at 3.7%. We were looking for that to climb higher to 3.8. Wage growth, hot. TK, 0.4%. The estimate, 0.3. Year over year, if you want that, 4.1%. Yeah, you know, the wage growth is, is, is a key determinant. We said that earlier as well, but I'm already staggering forward. Uh, John, we've got to get out to, what is it, February 8th, February, uh, you know, early, early February to get the revision report on this statistic. The revisions got my attention, negative 71,000. Sure. Is that weight that's out there that, that, that shows a slowdown. This is the calendar, the payrolls report just behind us about 15, 16 minutes ago. In front of us next week, the CPI report, the end of the month, we'll hear from the Federal Reserve. Equity <coughs> futures pulling back by just a third of 1% on the S&P, but we are rethinking the Fed's next move if you were indeed looking for that to be a cut and sometime soon. In the bond market on a two-year yield, higher by about six basis points on a 10-year, up by seven. Really pleased to say that joining us now is Bill Dudley, Bloomberg opinion columnist and former New York Fed president. Bill, you've had the benefit of about 17 minutes to go over some of this. What's your reaction to it? 
I think it just reinforces the notion that the Fed's not going to be in a rush to cut rates. So the last couple of weeks, there's been a sort of change of view that the Fed rate cuts might materialize a little bit more slowly uh, with less force. And I think that this just reinforces that. Economy's still doing pretty well. Uh, looks like we're going to have growth in the fourth quarter of 2% plus. Uh, financial conditions have eased a lot over the last uh, you know couple of months. Uh, so I think that uh, risks are that the Fed's going to keep rates higher for longer. Bill, an unfair question. Why is the economy doing well? Is it productivity? Is it a follow-on of pandemic stimulus? What's the why of what we saw in Q3, what Atlanta GDP says about Q4, and maybe a few people optimistic about the first half of 2004, 2024? Well, I think the biggest thing is that there were such large fiscal transfers that occurred during the pandemic that households and businesses are actually in pretty good financial shape for this late in the economic cycle. And so people have the ability to continue to spend. Uh, this is unusual. I, typically what happens is people get over their skis, they're overextended, Fed tightens, and that actually bites quite a bit on economic activity. This time, I don't think people are as overextended. And so the Fed rate hikes have had less uh, restraint on the economy. Given that, Bill, and especially since you said the Fed's not going to be in a rush to cut rates, do you think that the market is still pricing in too great of a chance of March rate cuts if they're talking about a 50 percent chance right now? Yeah, I do. I do. I think I think I mean, I think May is more likely. I mean, if the Fed wants to cut rates, I mean, they've made it pretty clear that they view that as inflation falls, monetary policy is being tightened and so that, that they need to follow inflation down. But to do that, they also have to get some signs that the economy is slowing sufficiently so that there's enough slack in the economy to bring inflation all the way down to 2% and keep it there. Uh, you know, the wage trend obviously is something that's going to concern them. If wages are rising faster than 4% a year, that's probably not considered 2% inflation in the medium term. Given that, and given the fact that we are seeing uh, the rate cuts being priced into the market more than you think is warranted by the Federal Reserve, how much do you think it set them back? the Fed officials, that the markets did rally as much as they did into year end. How much do you think that, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Alan Ruskin, how, many, how much do you think that that turbocharged the U.S. economy? I don't think it turbocharged the U.S. economy that much. I mean, the easier financial conditions just haven't been in place for that long. It's really only been a couple months. But I do think the Fed is a little frustrated by the fact that the market always wants to be more uh, dovish than the Fed uh, uh, wants, because that makes the Fed's job more easy, more, more difficult. Because as the market rallies, that eases financial conditions, that adds impetus to the economy, which means that, that then that there's more for the Fed to do rather than less. So I think they're a little bit frustrated. You know, Powell was asked about this in his press last press conference, and he basically said, yes, at the end of the day, though, that you know these things have to come together. Uh, what the Fed does ultimately determines where the Fed markets are going to end up. And so the Fed right. does hold the whip here, and they'll get their way. And I think the way they get their way is they'll just be slower than what the market expects. Bill Dudley, I've got to do an acclaimed surveillance audible and look at the celebration by you and the New York Fed over Dr. Masell uh, joining the St. Louis Fed. Bullard was always, with great respect to the gentleman from Indiana University, an outlier. His dot plot was always unique. What kind of dot plot are we going to generate with Alberto Masalam taking over at the venerable St. Louis Fed? Well, I don't have a really strong view that Alberto is going to you know, be dovish or hawkish. I think he's going to take the information as he sees it and respond accordingly. I think what he brings to the Federal Reserve, though, is the fact that he not only is he a really good economist, but he also understands markets really deeply. Uh, so that combination of macroeconomic knowledge and also market experience, I think, is you know pretty rare in the Federal Reserve system. So he brings a really a, a good, great tool set to the Fed. Yeah, I, I look, Bill Dudley, also, just within the crush of the jobs report, we have to look at your really spirited essay on not the fragility of our banking system, but just the idea of where we're going in 2024 and shoring up the supervision of our banks. Are you optimistic we can get that important job done? Well, I think that it's pretty clear based on events that happened last, uh, last March that there's supervision needs to do better. Uh, they need to be more forceful in forcing banks to remedy problems uh, more quickly. But one way I think that to do that, though, is to actually release some of these supervisory findings that currently are secret. Uh, if you knew that the, the supervisory findings were going to come out with a lag of, say, six months or so, that would create huge incentives on bank managements and banks' boards to get going to remedy the problems. Uh, right now, a lot of these problems are not known by people in the marketplace. 
and I think that makes it easier for the banks to sort of delay uh, and, and not proceed as quickly as they need to do to, to remedy their problems. Bill, fantastic column that came out from you earlier this week. Appreciate it. Bill, I just wanted to squeeze one further question in, if I can. Bill, you've been ahead of the curve big time on how far this Fed would have to go. Do you think there is still a risk that they have to move again, that another hike could be in our future? I think it's pretty unlikely. I think that the bar to raising rates again would be, you know, they have to totally reevaluate their whole framework. I think more likely story is that if things turn out to be stronger, they'll just keep rates higher for longer before they actually start to reduce rates. So I think the bar to raising rates again is pretty high at this point. Bill Dudley, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And Happy New Year. The brilliant Bill Dudley, former New York Fed president. Mike McKee is at about 22 minutes, 23 minutes with this jobs report. He's got more to say. Mike McKee, some final thoughts from you, sir, for this hour at least. Going into the opening bell in about 37 minutes. Yeah, there's some interesting aspects to all of this, John. Um, the the uh, wage number obviously gets people's attention. And when you look at the gains in wages, it's kind of across the board, mining up half a percent, manufacturing up half a percent, uh, durable goods manufacturing up seven tenths of a percent, service providing up half a percent, retail up eight tenths of a percent. So everybody was getting raises for the most part during the month of December, which is kind of interesting. But then uh, the idea that maybe uh, we're seeing a slowdown and things are going to get worse is belied a little bit by the unemployment news because when you look at the categories of unemployment, white unemployment uh, rose by two tenths, but black unemployment fell by six tenths, Asian by four tenths. So you're looking at the people who usually are last in, first out, and you would expect to see their unemployment rate go up if things were uh, getting worse. They're not. Uh, for them. So it, it's kind of an interesting situation that it, it kind of leaves you still scratching your head about where we go from here. I think we've been doing that for a while. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Fantastic job this morning, as always. On the surface, things look decent. Beneath the surface, Mike McKee says things look decent. Let's get you set up for the opening bell in about 36 minutes' time. Equity futures pulling back just a little bit, but recovering. We're down by about 0.2% on the S&P 500. We've been selling off all week on the S&P 500. Four-day losing streak on the S&P, five days on the Nasdaq. Yields a little bit higher this morning, up by five basis points, 4.43 on a two-year. To get you ready for the opening bell, Gina Martin-Adams, our chief equity strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us right now. Gina, good for the economy. Is it good for the equity market? What's your take on that? Yeah, the equity market is unfortunately in a bit of a sticky spot here to start 2024. We've been in a corrective process from an overbought condition where we ended 2023. So the, the backdrop headed into this report was not particularly conducive to gains for the equity market to start with. And then I would suggest the report is likely to have mixed results on the equity market. Remember, the consensus view is for slower growth and slower inflation headed into 2024. So while this is definitely a positive sign for growth, it's also a potentially inflationary signal with the wage numbers that were significantly above expectations, still above this 3.5% bogey that I think the Fed is watching on wages. So that mixed result is probably net negative for the equity market, considering the backdrop. Mm -hmm. uh, Gina, moments ago, Atif Malik at Citigroup just pushed against the gloom on Apple. He said his channel checks are good. He's got a 27% total return on Apple out. I don't want you to speak specifically about Apple, but I want to speak about what I've talked about all week, which is the acclaimed Martin Adams optimism on earnings growth right now. What does a gloom crew get wrong? Well, I mean, I think, frankly, the expectation embedded in markets is far too bearish. I mean, as much as the consensus is saying we're likely to get about 11% earnings growth, our macro model says that the market expectation is closer to 0% earnings growth for 2024, which would be nearly unprecedented considering that earnings fell a touch in 2023 to have 24 months of negative earnings growth on the S&P 500 as inflation is decelerating it is a really tough call to make, but that's what's priced in stocks. And this is what I mean when I say growth expectations are very, very low. No one is expecting acceleration in GDP growth, nor is the market apparently expecting much acceleration in earnings growth next year. But if to the degree that you are optimistic about earnings, you are somewhat reliant upon the inflation deceleration continuing. Where we get a, some degree of earnings optimism is not that we're expecting a remarkable recovery in revenue growth, 
but that margins are continuing to improve because inflation is decelerating. Companies are becoming more cost effect efficient. They're continuing to cut costs across the board. They're generally very lean and ready for any incremental revenue improvement. So you have a lot of upside potential surprise on the growth line. I, I just don't think that the market is expecting anything there. But you also have some potentially stickier than expected inflation, which could scupper the view a bit. Gina, just real quick here, how much does the wage gain that we just saw in the unemployment or the uh, employment report really challenge that margin question? Not much, Lisa, because wages are only a, a small percentage of overall operating margin changes in the S&P 500, where we're getting the greatest degree of our tailwind is because import prices are falling, producer prices are falling, and that's allowing companies some degree of pricing power. We've not had much net improvement in wage over the course of the last 18 months. So I would certainly love to see deceleration in wage growth as a component of potential margin expansion for companies over the course of this year. You don't want too much, obviously, because then it ultimately eats into the top line. But we'd like to see a little bit of deceleration to help boost the margin story. Yep. But it certainly has not been part of the tailwind so far. So I wouldn't say it's a huge risk to margin growth. It just could become a tailwind over the course of the year. Gina, great to catch up. Happy New Year. Gina, Martin Adams there of Bloomberg Intelligence following the payrolls report. TK coming in a bit stronger. Equities taking it OK. We've had a string of losses. Futures down by 0.2% on the S&P. We started with Steve Whiting of Citigroup this morning, and he said exactly the same thing, maybe in a different way, but the same vector direction of Gina Martin Adams. There's a gloom out there about corporations. Witness the weak Apple gloom that we've heard from Barclays, uh, Piper, uh, Sandler, and others. And the, the bottom line, John, is just simple. These pros and equities are saying earnings are too negative right now. JP Morgan results up next a week from now. We've had a drip feed of decent data, ADP, jobless claims, payrolls, CPI about a week away. On the open in the next hour, Rick Reader of BlackRock, Michael Collins of PGM, Anastasia Anaroso of iCapital from New York City. Good morning.